We are now live. Diana, you may start. Hello, my name is Diana Marinku, and I'm extremely happy to, to welcome you from the part of Art Encounters Foundation to this second edition of the Autumn School of Curating. Uh, we are extremely proud to, to have as a leader, curator Adrian Knotts, uh, who took the difficult mission uh, of tackling the new now alongside uh, a very interesting group of young curators who are participants uh, to this school and alongside uh, a very strong group of speakers uh, who will be joining us for these two days of public talks. Uh, the new Now Autumn School of Curating is a 10-day online seminar aiming to give young curators access to an international platform for dialogue, knowledge, knowledge exchange and learning. I think that the main question that uh, Adrian has raised, and we uh, hope to, to have this question guiding us throughout the school, is where and how we or art can engage. Uh, I think this is, a, this is a very important question in relation to defining what this uh, new now might be. Uh, we would like to warmly thank our guest today, our guests, and uh, um, of course, uh, uh, the guests will be speaking today and tomorrow, uh, and we are very grateful for, for their involvement and for their interest in the topic of the school. Um, and the guests are Heba Yamin, Carlos Amorales, Zeng Bo, today, and tomorrow, Ibrahim Neme, Joana Varsha, Tara Las Rado, and they will be accompanied by, uh, of course, Adrian Knotts, uh, who will start this uh, series of talks today. Um, just a few words about Art Encounters Foundation, uh, who is the co-organizer alongside Cluj Cultural Center of the School of Curating. Uh, this is a foundation which started in 2015 with the first edition of Art Encounters Biennial. And from 2018, we also have a permanent program of exhibitions, residencies, education, and editorial program. Uh, the aim of the, of the foundation is to create uh, a, a network and a support structure for the local art scene in in connection with the international one. Uh, therefore, we are also thrilled about uh, Adrian's approach uh, of the topic of this new now and his enthusiasm in creating this connection between all of us, our special guests uh, for this uh, today public uh, event who are coming from all over the world, but also the participants who also come from very different uh, backgrounds and from the very different places. Um, I would like to thank all of you who are watching this series of talks uh, and, the, and the participants who I hope you will engage in, in a dialogue with the speakers. Um, I would like to pass the word to Georgiana now, who is uh, here from the part of Cluj Cultural Center uh, and from European Center for Contemporary Art, uh, which is uh, an institution uh, in the making. And together with her, we will be uh, watching and filtering uh, the questions uh, that are coming from, from the Facebook audience. Um, and uh, after each talk, uh, we will try to make a selection of these questions so that also a larger audience can, can be engaged uh, in this dialogue. Adrian will be moderating this, the whole series of talks and uh, we will take the, the opportunity to, to, uh, to engage in this dialogue together. And also the break between the talks will, uh, will allow us for uh, also some informal time uh, and have a coffee together. So enjoy everybody and now I pass on the word to Georgiana. Thank you. Hello, thank you, Diana. I am Georgiana Boots, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to the Autumn School of Curating no Now, the second edition, and from part of Cluj Cultural Center. Um, a few words about the Cluj Cultural Center. It is a non-governmental organization, and its mission is to mobilize culture for social transformation and sustainable development. Cluj Cultural Center has developed as a result of the city's candidacy for the title of European Capital of Culture 2021. And although it did not win the competition, the organization continues to implement the cultural strategy then designed uh, from a new current perspective, making it a truly innovative organization at a national and European level in terms of its form, mission uh, and organizational model. The center has 104 members from cultural organizations and institutions, 
to universities, business um, and civil society associations, and to local and regional administration. Uh, I invite you to find out more about Cluj Cultural Center by uh, going on its uh, on its website that should appear uh, on the chat on this live streaming. And a uh, few words about this um, institution in the making, as Diana mentioned, ECA is part of the Cluj Cultural Center and is the future European Center for Contemporary Art in Cluj, an institution that aims to dedicate itself to researching and promoting artistic processes and works uh, in the field of visual, performing and media arts. In preparation for this center, um, we work on its institutional planning as well as organize various artistic projects. Since 2017, ECA has organized exhibitions, interventions in the public space, film screenings, workshops, and conferences. Last year, we co-founded together with our wonderful partners from Timisoara, the Autumn School of Curating. And our idea is to explore such a collaborative model for developing a professional network active in the field of contemporary art. So um, many young curators, writers, contemporary art professionals from all over the world have applied for the second edition of the Autumn School of Curating. We've received uh, outstanding applications, numerous of them, and uh, from there, from, from these, we selected 25 participants. They join us today and we are very happy and uh, welcome them. Um, and um, the program will unfold during these uh, next days through what we hope to be a very international, genuinely uh, international dialogue with these participants from Romania, Germany, Ukraine, the Czech Republic, Sweden, Bangladesh, Palestine, Serbia, India, Great Britain, and from various uh, fields of work and interests. So big thank you again to the participants, but as well to the speakers that join us today, as well as tomorrow. And I would like to very quickly go through today's public schedule. Um, so we start with uh, Adrian Notz, who will present to us the new now. Then Heba Yamin will talk to us about female subjectivities and technological dystopias. Carlos Amorales will present the happy uselessness of the artist. And uh, Zeng Bo uh, will uh, present uh, Dao is in wheat. And now uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce our course leader, Adrian Notz, a curator of incredible creativity, a king of Elgaland Vargaland and Chevalier de la Tombe de Bakunin. Between 2012 and 2019, he was director of Cabalet Vorter in Zurich. At first, he worked there as a curatorial assistant from 2004, and between 2006 and 2012, he held the post of a co-director. Between 2010 and 2015, he was head of the Department of Fine Arts at the Design School of St. Gallen University. Since 2007, Adrian Notz has been a diplomat for Enska State, and from 2008 to 2018, he was ambassador of the kingdoms of Elgaland Vargaland for Zurich. Adrian has organized numerous exhibitions, events, and actions with international artists, activists, and thinkers. And he will introduce his approach and idea of the new now. Inspired by Dada and the avant-garde and their end of history a century ago, he will be taking uh, us on this journey and talking about our end of future today and how this might lead into a new now that is crystallizing in the current situation even more and hopefully might be similar to the visionary new art avant-gardists were searching for only that our visions, as Adrian says, are not directed to a yet to come future, but to the now. Before giving the floor to Adrian, I would like to um, reiterate the invitation uh, for the public that is watching us on Facebook to ask questions in the comment section of the feed and we'll address uh, these, these questions after each presentation. It is really an opportunity to find out more about uh, the artistic, curatorial and activist, also research practices of our invited guests. So Adrian, I leave the floor to you and thank you all for joining. Thank you very much, Diana and Georgiana for this beautiful um, introduction and also for the invitation for, to me to be the course leader of the new now Autumn School of Curating. 
Um, I'm always a little bit um, shocked when I hear, you know, the idea of the new now and so on, because for me, it's maybe more just like a, a slogan I put up in the world and we will see what we can do with it. There's actually a term, as you can see here in the background, uh, that is from a Swiss artist, Kerim Seiler, and he used to use it for a, a project which he was doing in South uh, Africa. Today, I would like, I will quite classically just read a text, kind of my journey into what I think or could be the new now. It will be colored a lot with um, avant-garde art from the last century, because that is how I was uh, trained the last 15 years and brainwashed. So um, it, for me, it's like a point of uh, reverence. So I hope you will enjoy my small uh, reading. I try to be as uh, clear in pronunciation and in spelling the English words properly uh, so that you might be able to follow. My journey into the new now started two years ago in summer 2018. Then I was invited for a residency in La Tallera in Cuernavaca in Mexico. It was my first residency ever. So my plan for the duration of the residency was not to have a plan. I had been working very long on plan and with plans, all of them fully dedicated to Cabaret Volte. They were dedicated not only to the joyful curatorial work on artistic program, but unfortunately, above all, to the laborious fundraising and political justification in the local province of Zurich, where the birthplace of Dada is located. In my Don Quixotesque struggle with the Zurich windmills of bureaucracy, the deep valley narrow-mindedness of cultural politics, and the incestuous sheets of the local art scene, the book Philosophia, here, by Ilias. Am I still there? Hello. Uh, by Ilias gave me much comfort. Of course, my Dada saints were a safe space comfort zone, but in that moment, it was the Georgian writer Ilya. Stanevich. For at one point in the story, Ilyast realizes that all the efforts and plans that he and his Russian Tsarist companions are forging to reconquer the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople as a bit of the Orthodox sanctuary are nonsense. For Ilyast, the conspiratorial strategy of conquest and its implementation is first and foremost nonsense. The idea is even more nonsensical than the nonsensical sound language Zaum, which he and his colleagues Velimir Chlevnikov and Alexei Kruchenik invented during this period. Ilias, however, discovers an enormous pleasure in nonsense and, out of sheer pleasure in nonsense, becomes even more involved in the great conspiracy organized by his colleagues in Constantinople. Quote, he was happily, happy like crazy. The matter interested him immediately because it was nonsense. In this case, it made sense to stay. It made sense to fight. One can and must put everything on one card when the opportunity arises to do a little nonsense. A very rare opportunity, a very extraordinary, extremely valuable opportunity. For which Iliast was prepared to fly overseas or swim through them, an opportunity that unfortunately no longer existed in life. Playing Saint Sophia, historical tasks of Russia and similar sublime subjects, for the sake of which so many educated idiots and learned fools have scribbled down tons of paper, shed so much ink and blood, playing Tsargrad, you can't think of anything better, little Cloud Oblachko, you are a genius. Iliast wanted it to be played, wanted everything to end up as nonsense, nothing more. And since he wanted it to be this way and no different, 
it was this way and no different. So that was all said and as little philosophy as possible, please." End quote. In the first night, alone in that beloved pool in the jungle of Cuernavaca, I wrote the word animism on a piece of paper. A word I had learned half a year ago in the paradisiacal oasis of a Riyadh in the desert of Morocco, when I read for smooth entertainment Yuval Noah Harari's first bestseller, A Brief History of Humankind. According to Harari, when it comes to the development of our DNA, we are basically still nomadic hunter-gatherers. However, Harari's hunter-gatherers have the wonderful ability to be animistic. They live in a magical world full of spirits that animate all beings and non-beings in their environment and beyond. With their magical animism, they are so connected to the world that they live in harmony with nature, with plants and animals, with flora and fauna, as well as with rocks, rivers and mountains. They all have universal abilities. All of them are doctors, hunters and gatherers, cooks and carpenters, educators and artists. Harari's hunter-gatherers are specialized in everything because they do not have specialists. They seem to be superhumans who made their age the golden age of humankind. Today, we have a great romantic longing to return to the womb of Mother Nature and Mother Earth, to Gaia. It is a kind of de-alienation of humankind that we are trying to create in an auto or sympoetic way. We want to make humankind great again, and we want to start talking to octopuses. Countless activists, philosophers, biologists, science fiction and best-selling authors, artists and architects see this harmony of humans and nature as the only solution to save the planet and with it, humankind. They paint the icon of our post-apocalyptic life with the golden background of this age in bright colors. In the naive isolation of my residency, I had to admit to myself that I also tend to have this pathetic view of things and events. The kitschy idea of the magic of animism is also very close to my heart. These tendencies are probably the reason why I'm quoting a best-selling author and not some fancy speculative realist, realists, obscure object-oriented ontologists or cutting-edge cyber feminists. I don't know what traumatic experience Harari had that gave him such a pathetic and kitschy picture of the world, but in my case, it was the brainwashing by avant-garde art and thought that created total artworks by the meter to guide humankind into a better future. And as I discovered after a few hours in the Spartan villa with its lush garden in Cuernavaca, the man in whose bed I was sleeping had a similar inclination towards universal missions. He explained that there is no other way than theirs. No hay más ruta que la nuestra. There was no other way than that of the muralists. Muralism, David Alfaro Siqueiros explains, is the only real artistic innovation since the Renaissance. Between Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel and the wall paintings of Siqueiros, there was basically no art. What a beautiful audacity. It is therefore not surprising that Siqueiros later became known as a megalomaniac artist subject who created the greatest murals, mural paintings of all time. And together with his two colleagues from the muralist boy band, Los Tres Grandes, Diego Riviera, who was Frida Kahlo's uh, husband, and Jose Clemente Orozco used their muralist art, the highest form of uh, human expression, as the central force of the socialist revolution. Los Tres Grandes were in good company with other male avant-garde artists. Filippo Tommaso Marinetti stood on the roof of the world singing about the love of danger, 
glorifying aggressive action and war, the beauty of speed. He had already lived for some time in the realm of the absolute, since time and space had just died the day before the publication of his Futurist Manifesto in 1906, and the year before in the special theory of relativity. Six years later, in 1912, Vasily Kandinsky saw the artist as the solitary culmination of humanity's spiritual development. In this position, the artist was understood by only a few, but they pulled all of humanity forward. A few, a few years later, in 1916, Kazimir Malevich realized that he was the origin of everything and founded suprematism, which would clear the way for humankind and free them from the nets of the horizon like fish. Giorgio de Chirico moved in similar dimensions with his metaphysical art. As the ultimate antipole of the animistic primitives living in fear based on ignorance, the metaphysician knows too much and is therefore already beyond all boundaries and horizons of the human mind and its logic where he carelessly and cheerfully no longer receives impressions, but without interruption, discovers new phenomena and spectral elements. Compared to these bold men, my saints, the Dadaists, were somewhat more humble. In Zurich, the financial eye of the storm, the spa of the world, they sang, painted, abstract arts, made collages, composed poems and danced in search of an elementary art and a new order that would heal humankind from the madness of time and create a balance between heaven and hell. In search for new art, their boldest act was to say that they wanted to get rid of all isms. Hugo Ball was already looking for a league of people that orgiastically devotes themselves to the opposition of everything that is useful and necessary since 1913, when he saw the world entangled and chained in an economic fatalism and was longing for a power that would be strong and above all vital enough to put an end to the state of affairs. Richard Hülsenbeck declared in spring 1916 in Cabaret Voltaire that they found Dada, that they are Dada and that they have Dada. Dada was found in a dictionary, it means nothing. With this meaningful nothing, they wanted to change the world. They wanted to change poetry and painting with nothing. They wanted to change, they wanted to end the war with nothing. And two years later, in 1918, when the first wave of the Spanish flu hit the globe and the Allied troops started their 100 day offensive, offensive, which finally led to the end of World War I, our Romanian friend, Tristan Zara, shouted on the stage of the bel étage of a bourgeois guild house, Abolition de la mémoire, dada. Abolition de l'archéologie, dada. Abolition des prophètes, dada. Abolition du futur, dada. My avant-garde ghosts kept on visiting me hauntologically in the isolation of Siqueiros, Villa and told me about a problem that is still very familiar to us today, rapidly developing technology. We live, as the technologist and artist James Bridal called his book, published in the same year, uh, New Dark Age, in a new dark age. Uh, <clears throat> Bridal argues that we are lost in the sea of information, increasingly divided by fundamentalism, simplistic narratives, conspiracy theories, and post-factual politics. Despite the apparent accessibility of information, we are living in a new dark age. He describes how we no longer understand how our world is governed or presented to us, because the technology behind the presentation is far too complex to understand. Like many cultural pessimists of this and the last century, he wants to reveal the dark side of the utopian dreams of the digital sublime hyper objects 
that professionally stoned enthusiasts create in the Silicon Valley. Siqueiros, who was uh, still swimming in the pool of the villa in form of an opossum, only wanted to work with the most modern and newest technologies and media. Malevich, who, stood, who understood that everything arises from within himself, saw the only way to control the development of technology was to go beyond it and to be superior to technology with suprematism. Kandinsky and De Chirico had similar approaches when they promoted the spiritual and metaphysic. With their futuristic visions that went vertically beyond technology, they wanted to achieve pure energy, mark and mark the horizon of nothingness with a black square that became the ultimate icon of modernity beyond technology. Faced with the First World War, my Dada saints were more skeptical about technology and could not embrace the machines that killed millions in the trenches beyond their safe comfort zone Switzerland. In medieval Zurich, they drifted more into mysticism and Gothic and were fascinated by the so-called primitive art from Africa, Oceania, folk customs and indigenous peoples. They, like Harari, longed for animistic, for animistic human being. It was only after the war in 1920 that they were caught up in the belief in progress and then proclaimed in Berlin, art is dead, long live the new machine art of Tatlin. To overcome the progress of technology, the avant-garde had a strong idea of destruction. Or, as Boris Groys puts it, the Russian avant-garde and the early European avant-garde in general was the strongest medicine against any kind of compassion or nostalgia. Uh, it, it accepted the total destruction of all traditions of European and Russian culture, traditions that were not only dear to the educated classes, but also to the general population. Ignoring the paradox that I have a strong nostalgia for a movement that was totally opposed to any kind of nostalgia, and that I am referring to a European tradition to talk about the destruction of European traditions, I like to think of Marinetti, who wanted to tear down museums and libraries, and Malevich, who wanted to burn all museums and even all past epochs and keep the ashes to present them in a pharmacy. While the international avant-garde boys spaced off beyond all event horizons, the female futurists and modernist fighters were much closer to reality, the social, the political of gender and their bodies. And as some of the boys agreed on, also much more radical. The Dada Baroness Elsa von Freitag Loringhofen <clears throat> liberated in more than just sexual and gender respects, created a notorious reputation as a poetess, performance artist and enfant terrible. She would roam the streets, studios and salons wearing a fruit basket as an extravagant horse racing hat, tins of tomato paste as a bra, a birdcage with a living bird around her neck as a necklace and, a, and curtain cords as earrings. She asserted herself and her productions in one sentence, I am art. Inspired by the queer Dada Baroness occasionally dressing up as a man and for doing so, also being arrested on a crowded Fifth Avenue, Marcel Duchamp too, as Eros C'est la vie, finally became art. Duchamp understood that the Baroness is not a futurist, she is the future. The heavily disputed performance artist, writer and activist Valenti de saint point understood already 1912 in her Manifesto of Futurist Women that humanity is mediocre. And a year later, she promoted lust as a force that refines the spirit by bringing to white heat the excitement of flesh in her Futurist Manifesto of Lust. In her Feminist Manifesto from 1914, Mina Loy 
sees men and women as enemies with the entity of exploited for the parasite and the parasite for the exploited. She demands the unconditional surgical destruction of virginity throughout the female population at puberty as a protection against the man-made bogey of virtue, which she sees as the principal instrument of women's subjection. What kind of men can be enemies of women gets clearer in Hannah Höch's photomontage cut with the kitchen knife Dada through the last Weimar beer belly cultural epoch in Germany. In this photomontage, she attacked the beer belly as male symbol of a power obsessed patriarchal sluggish society and vulgar politicians. Höch created this photomontage in 1919 on the eve of the vote on women's suffrage in Germany. The photomontage shows predominantly men's heads, images of contemporary politicians. These men's heads from the Weimar beer belly cultural epoch in Germany have women's bodies that are dancing, twisting and turning. The dynamic women's bodies set the sluggish beer belly minds in motion. The dancing bodies are the female cut with Dada. It seems as if the avant-garde followed Nietzsche's declaration of God's death and anticipated and, and accompanied the massive political revolutions that were taking place. From the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the collapse of the Russian Tsarist Empire, the Chinese Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the colonial empires to the Mexican Revolution. Some avant-garde artists anticipated very participated very concretely and directly in the revolutions like Siqueiros in socialist Mexico and in the civil war in Spain, or the Russian futurists and later constructivists in the new Soviet state. While others, more abstractly with forms or with words, or concretely on gender equality, sexual liberation, body empowerment with performances, interventions or campaigns conjured up the revolution and launched modernism. It seems as if the avant-garde had to make sure that history ended on all possible levels, because the end of history opened up new visions of the future for them, because these unsentimental ideas of destruction were not only nihilistic, but always a new start from a point zero. The end of history, however, is a term that has lately been used, particularly in connection with the essay by philosopher Francis Fukuyama, published in summer 1989. Fukuyama borrowed the term from Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, Karl Marx, Alexandre Kojève, and of course, um, postmodern thinkers such as François Lyotard, Jean Baudrillard, and many others have been using it as well. According to Hegel's original conception, the end of history is the victory of a great ideology over all others. Fukuyama's idea is that liberalism triumphed over communism after both had triumphed over fascism. When the Iron Curtain fell and the internet was born, Fukuyama declared the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. In the past three decades, indeed, we have seen how neoliberalism, without any ideological opponent, could spread everywhere. Each of the past three decades has been marked by a more or less global crisis. After 1989, Neoliberalism took the form of turbo capitalism in former communist countries, creating a new mindset and so many new oligarchs. After 9-11, the West started the global war on terrorism and fear as well as panic became the dominant parameters of our mindset. The financial crisis of 2008 changed neoliberalism further and the archetype of the big business CEOs in tailor-made suits and dresses shifted towards the one of the tech nerds 
wearing t-shirt, jeans and sneakers while becoming a billionaire. The idea of success was finally democratized. Everybody can make it big time by launching their own startup. We are all unicorns. <clears throat> Tech innovations like smartphones, the cloud, big data, apps like Uber and Airbnb or social media and their influences not only disrupted big companies, but also made structures and values of our communication completely obsolete. In the last decade, technology was developed so fast that we can hardly imagine what the world could look like in only five years. Nor can we imagine a world without smartphones, social media or internet. We have lost the concept of future and our memory as well, as Zara was demanding a century ago. The rapid development of technology, namely the instant access to tons of information and the constant flow of breaking news, have made us lose the memory of the past as well as any vision of the future. Sense and content detached from the communication, from communication and anything became as important as everything else. And suddenly, the climate protest by a young girl sitting alone in front of the Swedish parliament became a global movement. World leaders invited that school kid to join their club. They started to understand, finally. They even claimed that they had changed their mindset and now needed to create a sustainable world. The question of how to save the planet and how to create fairer economies should finally lead us to better business making and to a healthier future. And then Australia started burning and COVID-19 exploded in Asia. <clears throat> A few weeks before I boarded the KLM flight to Mexico, I heard from the philosopher and media theorist Bernard Stiegler that the world scientists, that is 15,364 scientists from 184 countries, had sent a second message about the warning to mankind that their predecessors, over 1,700 scientists, including 104 Nobel Prize winners from 71 countries, had issued 25 years ago in 25 years ago. In 1992, they warned that the great change in our stewardship of the earth and of life on it is required. If the vast human misery is to be avoided. In 2017, 10 times as many scientists stated that with the exception of stabilizing the stratospheric ozone layer, humanity has failed to make sufficient progress in generally solving these foreseen environmental challenges. And alarmingly, most of them are getting far worse. Moreover, we have unleashed a mass extinction, the sixth in roughly 540 million years, wherein many current life forms could be annihilated uh, or at least committed to extinction by the end of this century. From the French-tinged words of Bernard Stiegler, I understood that the world could end in the next 50 to 70 years. In spring 2019, an Australian climate risk task force corrected the doomsday date to 2050. And in summer 2019, the US Air Force and NASA anticipated doomsday to 2040. Soon, or even now, during the isolation of the pandemic lockdown, we start to say, now, the end of our world is happening now. The house is on fire, as Greta Thunberg says. First, I was fascinated by the question, what will we do when we know the end of humankind? My distorted mind from working with ideas that were more than a century old could not get rid of the thought that art would no longer make sense. Because my noble thought was, we create art for the future generations to discover and to refer to. 
But if there were no future generations, what would we do? What would art look like? Would this transcendent belief in creating art for the future still prevail? What would a completely imminent art look like and how would it influence people? I found some answers later in studio visits that freed me from the pathetically naive bubble in which I, was, I floated and lured me away from Siqueiro's pool, where I narcissistically marveled at the reflection of myself glorified by the avant-gardists. The studio visits took me to the capital's metro metropolis of millions and catapulted me into the here and now. Populism, memes, digital age, protests and resistance, social injustice, identity issues, colonial, colonial heritages, oppression, corruption, <clears throat> violence, narcotraficantes, a new president, murdered politician, feminicides, climate catastrophe, and so on. Some of the artists I visited were obsessed with micro histories. Others researched and imagined identities and questioned the contemporary world they live in. I learned from the courage from them, I learned from them the courage to boldly go where no one has gone before and to be a nerd. Unlike my artist demiurgs of a century ago, they seem to work out of an urge or instinct with a certain idea and interest. They investigated and experimented aesthetically until something might appear that could stand on the roof of the world by itself and inspire and delight others. Following the idea of micro histories, as I have learned, local thinking and local action gives a new and different perspective on the big picture. I realized that the idea of creating universal visions of the future, the terms like vision and future, are not really part of today's art practice. Vision and future have become terms that are instrumentalized in keynote speeches, in management, technology, and marketing contexts. We were no longer able to create great utopias. And in the face of this omnipot omnipotent hyper-liberal colossus, we continued to practice postmodern deconstructivism. We explored our local communities and even ourselves with the principle of microhistories in the hope that we could draw conclusions from the small to the big. It no longer made sense to refer to the past to practice culture in order to learn for the future and to create art. The principle to which we as humans have been referring since we learned to inhabit caves was no longer valid. We could no longer learn from the experience of the past. We could no longer learn because we understood the past only as means of decorating and shaping the present. At best, as a boastful instrument to perform knowledge and to stand in the way of different thinking with the pretentious surprised look and wisely raised eyebrows. We neither knew what to do with the past, nor could we create utopias for the future. We simply did what we would do if we knew the world was coming to an end. We focused fully on the present. To end the idea of the end of future, I was able to create an exhibition in La Tallera, where I had spent my haunted residency. Right next to the villa of David Alfaro Siqueiros was his giant studio, which today serves as a museum. Using the thoughts and ideas mentioned here as a backdrop of the exhibition, I transferred the villa into the museum in a highly symbolical, but also very literal my manner. All the rooms I was roaming there the year before in dialogue with the century with the century old ghosts were now built into the big hall of the museum, giving it a labyrinthic spatial structure. The exhibition played with the idea that 
end of future as a notion could open up perspectives and even imaginations into a new now. End of future showed different approaches by artists that deal with art historic, historical references, transhistorical works in abstraction, contemporary post-apocalyptic situations of war and lost hopes, escapist dreams, surveillance, human and environmental catastrophes, spiritual and religious narrations and icons, playful compositions and interpretations of reality, alternative myths, personal universes of obsession, psychographies and soundscapes, opening vast fields of imagination and the creation of new creatures and megalomaniac totalitarian utopias that change our understanding of politics and society. With End of Future, I hope to expand the now eternally and end time, to actively and consciously use the now. Unfortunately, the universe took this idea a bit too literally and locked down a big part of our planet so that the artworks from the exhibition that ended in March this year are still there a year after the opening of the exhibition. The current pandemic makes us experience what our mind has already been passively tuned to, different from all dystopian Hollywood movies about the end of the world we will be as passive as our end of future. Stay at home and please save the world by sitting on your couch. In this self-quarantine time, our mindset is changing. Now, the end of future clearly unfolds. Nobody can imagine what is truly coming. The term for the, term for the time being, or until further notice, dominates the current thinking Physical movement has been reduced, making time horizons disappear and the concept of duration totally different. Our minds are struggling to imagine even the closest future, like the next few weeks, and 2020 seems to have passed in no time. But we also start to feel how important human contact is. Simple things like taking a walk, having a beer, or experiencing the noise of a lively street have a different taste and sound to us. All of our rituals of social gatherings become much more precious. Real life ex experiences, as opposed to virtual ones, gain new quality. We finally start to understand how important art can be for our mental well being and evolution, and that our memory and imagination is also a great and exciting place to travel to. We can start traveling without moving. As protagonist Paul Atreides says in the 1984 David Lynch science fiction movie, Dune. In this here and now, we do not only live a highly ambivalent hedonism of panic and decadence, but, also, but we also sit down in front of the trees we planted to compensate for our share of CO2, and we begin to breathe before, with, and through them. The trees and plants help our animistic being to connect to the universe. The breathing might become our daily calibration with reality. We investigate our own mind all biological, emotional, sensual, and psychic processes that happen in our bodies. We look at, the pro at these processes with one special ability of humans, consciousness. Our consciousness will expand infinitely, creating a new now, full of imagination, sensitivity, intuition, driven by greatness, openness, and broadness. The global lockdown forces us to breathe and not to be out of breath while ch chasing success. Solidarity, a word that sounds like anarchy and has been used a lot in the first few weeks of the pandemic, seems to be needed more than ever. The new now, which we can discover in this pandemic-induced pause from the daily craziness and unconsciousness, will be guided by sense, sensibility, and sensitivity. We can paradoxically hope 
that exactly now we have the time to reset and to become a new active community of sense. COVID-19 has frozen the present. It makes our lungs sick, but it may give us a new pneuma, a breath of fresh air and spirit, a new force of life. Or, as Spock tells us at the end of the second season of the new Star Trek Discovery, now does matter, but everything before no longer exists. What will happen next has not yet been written. We have only now. That is our greatest advantage. What we do now, here in this moment, has the power to determine the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. I propose to open uh, the discussion if um, the participants from the school have uh, any questions, please share, share it with us, either um, by opening your microphones or by writing it in the chat. It might be a little bit, a lot of input and a lot of references. So. There can be all this thoughts about uh, so many ideas that you shared with us, not necessarily particular questions. Mm -hmm. Hey, so I have a question. I, you started the conversation talking about uh, the early 20th century, kind of Zalm, meaninglessness, nonsense. I wonder, of course, with disregarding all of everything in the past, do you think meaninglessness has a place in 2020? Kind of what does it look like? Yeah, is there a place for it? You mean if, if nonsense has a place in 2020? Yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> I, I think I... <laughs> One can answer the question in two ways. Uh, on the one side, I think nonsense is uh, omnipresent everywhere you know, in our daily lives and how we experience um, contemporary world. But, uh, um, and in that sense, that's why I quoted Ilias. I think in, in certain ways of working, we just have to go with the flow of nonsense, <laughs> you know, enjoy it. That uh, certain things you know, just don't make any sense. And otherwise we get totally, um, how would you say, demotivated to actually do anything. But I think on the other side, um, I, there's of course a strong longing, and maybe that's not on the other side, but as a reaction to this for, for meaningfulness and for sense. So I also end basically the, the presentation with this idea, um, which I stole from Charles Concierge, uh, the idea of sense, sensitivity, and sensibility, um, that the word sense has a lot of different dimensions. And so in a way, yeah, it's a quite simple relation between nonsense and uh, all meanings of sense. Thank you, Adrian. Maybe uh, to break the ice a little bit more, I was um, um, thinking that in particular there were a few uh, words that caught my attention in uh, uh, this uh, rich ideas that you sh shared with us. And so we were talking about how we are passively awaiting the end of uh, time, actually. Uh, I want, uh, so I'm rephrasing, I think you used a little bit different uh, words, but this idea of, of being passive um, and then talking about the idea of solidarity and that it sounds a lot like anarchy. So I wonder how these, these words are related to each other, the idea of the passivity, solidarity and anarchy. Is there um, such a connection? Um. Yes, 
Is that a good answer? No. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, maybe not. I mean, what, what I was trying to show with the passiveness of this idea of the end of future is that um, because we, we are uh, not really consciously um, using this, this expansion of time or this end of future, but more like passively in, in a state of maybe panic and, and hedonism, like a, a strange mix. And the anarchy kind of plopped up also in, in certain ways of how we are now, like at the beginning of the pandemic, the word solidarity was around a lot. Suddenly people were talking about basic income uh, we have other ideas which are in a way very anarchistic is that uh, the whole idea of participative structures of decentralization of um, autonomously organized uh, communities um, have certain anarchistic um, motives or uh, backgrounds and as my because I'm the Chevalier de la Tombe de Bakunin and it's a little bit what uh, Bakunin was talking about but in that sense, what is missing in this whole, uh, to, to be a real anarchism would be the, the, the network of, uh, of um, the solidarity network of distribution of goods to, to kind of equally distribute them. So we have this uh, moments of decentralization, participative structures uh, of non-hierarchical structures. And now, with the second wave, basically everybody has to figure out themselves how they want to deal with uh, isolation and and decontamination. So that was just like a I don't know a kind of associative talk told that suddenly anarchy, as opposed to ideas of communism or liberalism, started plopping up. Um, hi, yeah, I, I would like yeah. to thank you, Adrian. It was very um, broad, a uh, bunch of uh, interesting ideas. And uh, there are a lot of actually uh, shaking on my head. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm part of that um, because I, I really. Uh, feel connected with uh, some of the questions you were raising or you are raising in, in relation to um, this now that we are living. And um, actually part of those questions, um, I believe um, we can't actually uh, answer them or we don't have the tools to answer them to understand the, 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 the now as you propose at the end of your talk. It's because perhaps we are still asking questions from the modernity, from inside the, the paradigm of mo modernity. Um, and uh, maybe what we require now is uh, to understand the Fukuyama end of history, you know, as, as the end of this lineal history that the Western culture is being building up or has been building up. Uh, with the hegemonics of um, power and perspectives, and maybe to go into understand history as um, as you point the micro histories, the, the 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 histories of the others that are that are also happening at the same time, and that uh, brings me to um, the question of um, we haven't actually in the Western resolved a big issue, which is the division between humans and non-humans. And that comes from, uh, as, as some the colonial theories said in 1942, when this uh, moment in human history, um, Europe and the so-called Americas uh, enter into contact. And uh, from there, that very precise moment, there was um, a moment of a starting of colonizing what, uh, and, and, and also separating and splitting apart what was human and nature. So perhaps we haven't uh, go back to resolve all these ontological and epistemological impositions that's been happening in the Western and it's coming from the history in the past and we just trying to resolve a now that is not 
um, it's just bringing more and more complex questions, but without taking into account all these other aspects. So, which are related to the, as I said, this non-human and 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 the other also still there is a question of what we call the other from the modern perspective. Uh, Mm, so also like the question of like to return to nature, I have a lot of problems with that <laughs> because I, I feel like if we now return to nature, we put um, without resolving this division, uh, we put um, a lot of weight into um, in the, at the shoulders of communities and ecologies that, that have been struggling since long time, like indigenous and natives in the Amazonas and other parts of the world, trying to to just keep uh, uh, surviving. And um, we, from our privilege in the Western, trying to go back to the to nature from uh, without resolving this division, as I said, then we. It's a very easy task, I find it, um, because we we back to something that uh, we still detach. We don't understand what is that. So perhaps what we need to do is first to resolve, to recognize, to repair a lot from the Western, and 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 then to learn how other ecologies and 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 beings have been uh, uh, fighting for the surviving within nature. And that's a decolonial process that it takes a really a big effort because it, it needs to check the pillars of the Western, Western culture. I also have a kind of troubles with a uh, carry on thinking from the individualistic approach that modernity give us the privilege of me, I think, therefore I exist and therefore I resolve my own future. Uh, I believe that in this separation between humans and non-humans, uh, we, from modernity, we detach more into the individual and then we don't have the tools to connect to each other and to communities and to natures. And um, I'm trying to delink myself more and more to those perspectives nowadays and trying to embrace more than trying to resolve the problem, embrace what is happening. Um, but I think it's a very difficult moment for all of us because inside the Western, we don't have a diversity of uh, epistemological diversity that is really needed to, to see that the problem is, is very complex. It comes from different perspectives. So that's what I wanted to just bring into the discussion. Uh, yeah, I'm, I was I've also, I think I talked about it at the, at the beginning, but you may have noticed that I used, uh, it's like a, how did I, a safe go-to area, uh, irony. Yeah. So if you talk about these ideas of being animistic and so on, uh, it's, of course, it's still a very um, European or Western idea or this, this epistemology that you're talking about. Yeah? So I don't know... Um, what the right direction would be, of course. Um, we maybe none of us knows. And maybe that's exactly the the good point that we um, we don't know where we are going. So we just basically need to go. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, there's certain hints like uh, with Donna Haraway or whatever, where it's like the idea of this not going back to uh, nature or to to this animistic being, but to go forward to nature to to use all technology that we have and to combine it in, um, in um, how would you say, uh, yeah, in this process. But what the, the, the thing I like about what you said is that basically we have to try and get rid of um, uh, the mythologies that we are still basing a lot of things on, you know, like the, the old basically European Greek mythologies and maybe try and, uh, Break up these concepts that um, that are forming our simple way of thinking, even in, in just like a dualistic way, uh, nature and us. Or, like you said yesterday, uh, we have to get into the river and not see the river as as the border. Yeah. So, yeah. So what we will do next week is we'll write a new mythology for mankind, and uh, 
and break up all the concepts that have been driving us for the last uh, 5,000 years, at least from this um, European perspective. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I think that's a, a pretty good point to, you know, like bring the the whole idea of that class back in of um, the question um, we mentioned before of where and how can art engage. You know, like when, when you say that, um, yeah, writing new mythologies and stuff like that, it's basically not that wrong, I guess. And I feel like there is a tendency in the arts and in exhibition making at the moment to do exactly that, to use art to see like where the future could could take us and to to kind of to do a research on what elements could be part of that. And I was wondering um, how you feel about the question of how that kind of art relates to the art that you were mentioning or that kind of art making from the avant-garde or from like the back in the days 100 years ago. I think in a certain way, and I also try to show that a bit, um, maybe more with the, with the women avant-garde artists, a lot of the topics that we are dealing with today have already been around back then. And, and, what's, and I'd like to think of it that maybe they were not visionary back then, but we just didn't really get any further since then. So it's not that these ideas about gender equality, uh, about uh, how to say, queer identities and so on is topics that are now up again since the last 10 15 years more or less um, but yeah it's kind of disappointing to see that human humankind hasn't really gone any further i think the big difference between and that's what i tried to stress with the with the avant-garde boy band so to say is that they all have this totalitarian uh, approach and a lot of stuff especially with the futurists if you read that today, it's it's very fascist, and uh, and we, and, I mean, I wrote, I read some of the uh, femi- uh, the manifestos of um, what's, what was the name, Valentine Saint Point, and that if I would read it over here, it would be like a, a, a huge discussion about, um, uh, yeah, what kind of values these avant-garde artists had. So there's certain things that were clearly um, from our perspective today wrong but that back then it had to be kind of daring and what I think today uh, there's like with contemporary art a lot of it of course refers to this history kind of stays within this art history uh, we, like I just did now basically <laughs> using uh, old ideas um, and but the more uh, at the moment, the more we, we look at contemporary art, it's, it's kind of opening up. It's also thanks to this more global movement, that including the global South and different perspectives on, on what modern and contemporary art can be. Um, yeah, cha- is changing the narrative. So for it might be confusing, but I think uh, confusion is, is good. I have a question as well. Um, uh, there was a phrase that stuck with me, and you said uh, the Dadaist saints did not understand technology. Um, and I'm wondering if, uh, how would you say that uh, these Dadaist saints uh, uh, would relate to um, our relationship with objects now, all, all of this accumulation that surrounds us, uh, and the accumulation of objects and ha- uh, do you think that uh, their um, their approach might be useful to us now? Hmm. Uh, I, I didn't say that um, they didn't understand technology. I said they opposed to the idea of technology. So that's basically because what the Dadaists saw was machines killing uh, human beings in the first world war where you had it's the first war with um, how do you say mass weapons tanks uh, planes gas etc and so in that sense um, 
they couldn't embrace this idea of technology and also in, and couldn't really go beyond it, like uh, the Russian futurists, for example, or the Italian futurists. And so at the beginning here in Zurich, they were more uh, into looking back into Gothic and, and mysticism using these kind of uh, mystic ideas of some um, medieval uh, say thinkers and philosophers. Um, and the second part is like what you said about objects around us. I guess you're talking about the, our uh, high, how do you say, stage or level of <laughs> consumption and commodities. And over there, um, I also, maybe I was, uh, I guess I was too fast with uh, Hugo Ball, who was saying that um, already in 1913, that we, that the society was uh, entangled and chained to an economic fatalism, which would then also give everybody a certain role and function in this economic fatalism. And he was then uh, looking for a power that would be strong enough to, to free us or to free them back then from, uh, from this situation, from this uh, state. And of course, since then, it hasn't gotten better. It has only gotten worse in terms of uh, our uh, dependency on, on, uh, on economy and on commodities and so on. So his solution and also that's this nothingness and nonsense idea is that basically if he says if we orgiastically devote ourselves to the opposition of everything that is useful and necessary so basically we withdraw from being productive um, then we can kind of fight this economy fatalism and the and it was kind of exciting or nice or interesting to see that now during the pandemic lockdown in the first couple of weeks when when businesses had to close that none of these businesses none of economy had kind of a, a backup plan had a kind of um how would you say safe space where they could continue for two or three weeks so it was everything always is on the edge so you're actually always in in production to to actually survive and in that sense, I was thinking at the beginning of the pandemic that in a way it was it kind of showed very nicely how what Hugo Ball was talking about. So if we stop being productive and useful and necessary, then the whole system, economic system would and can collapse. So that's why we have this strange situation now where we have to be in lockdown, but also have to be productive. Thank you. I think I will jump in now with a question uh, from the audience on Facebook. It's a question coming from an artist from Timisoara who was wondering whether you think that in the new now we need again a little more from the avant-gardistic uh, avant spirit. So how perhaps how would you uh, translate this avant-gardistic spirit into, uh, into the present? Um. It's the paradox I was talking about that we, um, of course, we need the avant-garde spirit, but we need it to get rid of it. So <laughs> it's like, uh, that's what the avant-garde did. They got rid of everything past. And uh, uh, in that sense, the only idea with which, which you can take from the avant-garde is to forget the avant-garde. So it's like this kind of paradox uh, situation. I will also jump in with a question from uh, the public watching us on live. A very easy question, Adrian. What do you think is the role of the curator in the new now? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, uh, because of anarchy, I also know that uh, Bernard Stiegler died in summer and uh, David Graeber died this summer. So I started reading uh, uh, David Graeber. And over there, he talks about um, the idea of bullshit jobs and shit jobs. So while I was wondering, maybe curating is actually a bullshit job. It would be nice if it's a shit job, but uh, so maybe that's the idea that we can try and shift 
curating or being a curator from a bullshit job, which is like a, how do you say, a made up job, um, like PR consultant or whatever, into a shit job, which is um, the real work to actually be, uh, how do you say, engaged. At the same time, I was also reading uh, Douglas Adams, with his uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and the end of the uh, restaurant at the end of the universe. And over there, he also has the same idea with basically three arcs that flew away. There's one arc A that has all the artists, high achievers, thinkers, etc. Um, I don't know, kings and so on, and queens in it. Then there's a second arc with um, that's arc C with all the people who actually do the work. So all the workers. Um, and so on. And then there's an arc B, that is the only arc that actually flew away uh, from the planet with um, uh, television consultants, PR managers, uh, hairdressers. I think hairdressers are an essential job. But um, these kind of people um, that have been uh, dominating our, like, like I said, uh, mediocre humanity a lot. So that's the art that finally crushes onto a planet and that planet is earth so we know why we have so many bullshit jobs nowadays um, yeah is that a good answer to the role of curator in the school of curating we will wait for a reply okay <laughs> Are there any more questions from the participants? Um, I have a question as well. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, because you talked um, about that idea, that trio um, of sense, sensibility, and sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you could expand a bit more on what you said that um, sense has many meanings. Like, do you also think about it um, outside of the art world or into kind of, um, I don't know, science, like interdisciplinary um, idea or what, how exactly um, does that work for the new now, these, uh, these uh, three concepts? Um, well, I think of it um, out of any kind of <laughs> disciplines. I think it's like a human, uh, how would you say, feature or uh, idea. And uh, for me, the idea is a little bit to, to not think of it as three concepts, but as one. So that sense in the sense of sense, uh, to make sense and to have sense, um, also combines the idea of sensibility and sensitivity. So it's also about how to say the, the tactile uh, tacit knowledge about uh, the human interaction and so on. So I think, um, yeah, that's maybe if you look at, if you want to talk about contemporary art scene, I think a lot of it is very, uh, especially thanks to creators, uh, very academically driven and about uh, it's a lot of ideas and theories that are trying to be implemented on, on certain exhibitions and, and artists. So a lot of, I like to refer to one of my um, artist friends who said that quite often uh, you can, if you have a nice text for an artwork, it becomes totally meaningful. But if it's, if you actually just look at the artwork, it doesn't have any meaning. He says it's like if you eat, if you um, make a bowl of pasta and you burn the pasta, then it will taste shitty, even if you have an explanation about it, why you burnt it, because it's about, I don't know, burnt down forests and so on. So it doesn't, so this idea of uh, relying more on your natural senses, on your um, perception, and that in that sense, the idea of aesthetics and aesthetics uh, is kind of important for this, um, for to make sense. Uh, we actually, sorry, sorry, we actually have in the chat section, I believe uh, a few questions which uh, relate a bit to 
your previous answer regarding curating. So we have a question from Christopher. Is it our mission then to use our collective apathy and pessimism and try to convert it into as a force through art for radical shifts in collective consciousness for change for the now? And then we have also an answer from Edith from the group uh, who says, I was reading how much of our apathy and pessimism are designed, so maybe we need frictions rather than radical shifts. So perhaps you would like Adrian to also comment on this. I, I'm not quite sure if I understood um, the idea. So of course the idea is a little bit to, to get out of this apathy um, and to, to do something, to be active. But uh, the second part about uh, friction, what was it? I think Edith is here, no? Yes, but I'm very shy. So oh. it was more easier. And so I was thinking a lot about how much of the art world it's focused on is still on exhibition making or still on, you know, specific spaces. Mm -hmm. And um, how much of our mindset it's actually based on everyday interactions and much of our interactions are based on the objects and the um, ideas that we encounter and so forth and much of this and, and much of what it's called anthropocene it's made by design and designers and ideas that are put forefront so i read, read a lot about this um, in beatrice colonna and mark wigley's are we human um, and this was very interesting because they were talking about how even our pes pessimism and also our uh, passivity towards, you know, this kind of lack or like uh, lack of energy of interaction. It's mediated by objects that are supposedly uh, and design, which is supposed to keep us like that. You know, you have everything at hand, so you don't have to think what the function of an object is until it is broken, so to use, I think, Kant's uh, reference. So it's a bit, it's a bit on this sense that I think it has a lot to do with, with how we break some of the fictions that have been created on, you know, what our role is, how we interact and so, so forth, like through little things and radical shifts, because I think radical shifts um, are always very outspoken, but they have little or like not such a big echo in how people actually interact and in our everyday life. And in this sense, I was also thinking on what our manifesto would be then, like how, how we relate to this idea of a manifesto. I mean, your, your, your manifesto, not our manifesto. Each of you will write the manifesto. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know what to say to this. I agree that, you know, of course, this kind of radical gestures is, um, is a thing from the past that I tried to, to show that. Um, and maybe I think the, what, what struck me a little bit in what you were saying is that maybe we should also just use this uh, situation yesterday we were talking about retirement as a kind of pause you know to to have this moment of reflection and to figure out where where one can go from from here so of course the the, the autumn school with the new now slogan and we want to create the new now etc is has a kind of taste or sense of a, of a big radical gesture but uh, I think also in it, in this nowness of the idea, um, it also shows that it's, it can't be this kind of um, radical global gesture, whatever. So, I, I, yeah, I don't know, but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I also like what you said about the yeah, design and how this, um, how design actually makes us very passive in uh, dealing with with our everyday world and objects. Yeah, so I believe we also had uh, Kaur who wanted to uh, ask a question. And then I propose perhaps to wrap it up to have a 10 minutes break until our next guest. Um, hi, everyone. 
Thanks. Uh, yeah, no, so I'm listening for the time and I'm trying to connect uh, your dot with my understanding to living in Southeast Asia as different mythology and previous understanding and how we are setting this new now. And what is like kind of, there's two parts. Like one is that I'm curious and another thing I'm kind of really like to share and see how you give me feedback. The thing is like here, like uh, the word Dada, like when I received the word first time, like not for this project, but much before, like the word Dada has a very different meaning. And uh, like in terms of language and why I'm saying, because everything which comes to me, it contains certain ideas, like idea of now, idea of future, idea of past. So like, so when I'm, I'm listening your like all the projections about nowness and end, one thing is constantly triggering me, especially like that because you're making some benchmark like the 9-11 and things like USSR. I'm looking at the time like when we just have a like election result we had from US. Like, and the, the, one of the interesting thing I found yesterday uh, that there is a website who declared that uh, uh, there's a con like kind of speech or something by the ex-president uh, and one journalist put this word that it's a nonsense, like it's utterly nonsense, and it's a, and it's kind of acceptable because we are living in a post-truth world. And so, from that context, like how you see, like how a dada, like from the lens of dada, like how you see the future, in in context of consent and discipline, like is there any scope? And also, like if there is no such thing, is there any way we can understand chaos? in that new nowness, like there is any any scope up to practicing chaos, like not very structured everything, like regimentedly, okay, we have to follow this and this and this and that. Like, do you understand what I try to mean? Like, that, yeah. Um, yes, I guess, I, I don't know if I understand, but I can give an answer. Um, it's like the, you were talking about <clears throat> Dada and uh, our contemporary situation and this is, something I've been asked a lot as a, a Dada director for 15 years. And so in that sense, it triggered like an automatic response <laughs> from my side, which um, in uh, like at the end of the Dada era, there was Kurt Schwitters who said that you can pronounce Dada in three different ways. You can say Dada, you can say Dada, or you can say Dada. Mm -hmm. So he said Dada sounds very vulgar, uh, sluggish kind of obscene and Dada is the style of our time and our time doesn't have any style while Dada sounds very indifferent uh, that's what art critics would say because they don't understand about what Dada is and then you have Dada which for uh, Kurt Schwitter sounded French metropolitan uh, it has Werf and Elan and he goes on and says Dada is the best medicine against our Dada time. So in a way, you could say that Dada, uh, Trump was and is very Dada. He's, a, he's super vulgar. He doesn't have fitting suits. Uh, he doesn't make any sense, etc. And in that sense, we need Dada to fight the Dada Trump. And we shouldn't be too, we shouldn't be Dada. No, so what, no, but again, what I, I understand, but what I try to like understand more because you are very specifically giving a lot of examples, which is very relevant. I want to read, study and re look back. But one thing is missing, which I kind of try to understand, like, because here, I can give you three, couple of examples, which probably close to Dada, but they are more close to absurdity, like absurdist. Okay, and because we, in, in, in Oriental studies, we have a specific um, theory or understanding called rasa, like, like how you understand different aesthetics. And one of the rasa is about absurdity. And one of the absurdist writer we have in, in literature, he never claimed himself dada, but he always saying there is a space for nothingness, like non, so how, from your point of view, from your discipline, how you see and how I'm going to see, and if you can help me, the difference between absurdity and nonsensical. And like, is there any at all difference? Like even in the new now condition, Uh, the difference between absurdity and nonsensical. Um, 
Well, I think the the idea of the of of um, nonsense is uh, like the word basically says is uh, being without sense. No, and absurdity is kind of more uh, a kind of detour or to to look at it from different um, points of uh, of perspectives. So. Um, nonsense is not necessarily absurd and absurdity is not necessarily nonsense but I, I i think i would have to think about more about this to give a proper answer this is now just <laughs> improvising and uh, also the problem is our time slot is over and i um, need to go to the toilet so uh, uh Diana, okay, so I, I propose I propose we have a coffee break uh, during which the live streaming will be stopped, but this room will still be open for you to interact in the meantime, and we see each other then in 10, uh, in 10 minutes, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Welcome back. So hello, welcome back. Our next speaker is Heba Yami. Are you with us? Hi, hello and welcome. Hi. We are very happy to, to have you with us today. Thank you for having Adrian. me. Adrian, I think uh, he's still in his coffee break. We can wait a little bit uh, longer for Adrian. Meanwhile, I would uh, take the opportunity to say for those who are just joining our live feed that we are uh, here now on uh, the second edition of uh, the Autumn School of Curating called The New Now. And um, on the first day of our public talks, we've just had, uh, we've heard Adrian talking about the new now and uh, following him will be Heba Yamin. Also, I would add that uh, who is watching us uh, can, can join the conversation by posting their question uh, into the comment section of uh, the Facebook streaming. And me and Georgiana will try to select as many questions as possible and um, yeah, uh, transmit them to, to the speakers and try to, to make uh, an, a very engaging dialogue with the participants at the Autumn School of Curating, but also with the viewers who are following us. Welcome back, Adrian. Hello. If you would like to introduce uh, Heba, then we can start. Yes, I will. Uh, I will try. I will, of <laughs> course, fail. Um, I will start easy by just uh, reading the biography that was already published. So, artist uh, Heba Amin, who we are very happy to welcome here among us, uh, is a Berlin-based multimedia artist, researcher, and lecturer who looks at the converge of politics, technology, and architecture. Her works and interventions have been covered by the New York Times, Guardian, Intercept, and CNN, among others. She has had recent solo exhibitions at the Mosaic Rooms, which I think is still on or just closed. And until March, the still on. <laughs> still on till March, okay. And um, the Center of Persecuted Arts in Solingen, as well as Böttcherstraße Prize Exhibition in Bremen and the 10th Berlin Biennial in 2018, the 15th Istanbul Biennial in 2017, and the 11th African Biennial of Photography in Bamako in 2017, and the 12th Duck Art Biennial in Senegal in 2016. I uh, got to know Heba, or better, her work in the Berlin Biennial in 2018, where, um, as I was saying before, uh, it just uh, it was an artwork that uh, immediately impressed me, and it was on. Uh, to, to be super honest, it was one of the few of the Biennial actually, and after that, I um, that was maybe my first conscious encounter with the work of Heba because subconsciously I might have also experienced the hack on the homeland uh, telenovela that she initiated uh, some years before. And then uh, I invited her to be part of the exhibition uh, End of Future, which uh, opened now a year ago and ended in March. And Actually, I only got to know Heba in person, so we had a kind of virtual relationship and dialogue already before um, in, that was in January this year, where she had a talk at the Münchner Kammerspiele in her role, which is one of her predominant roles as a female uh, dictator. And as far as I know, uh, Heba will also be talking about this uh, special project, which is just one among a million of other projects. She's a very um, enthusiastic and engaged and hardworking uh, researcher and artist. 
um, which is called Operation Sunken Sea. That was also the work that you showed in the Berlin Biennial and also the work I showed in the End of Future um, exhibition. So uh, I'm very happy that you are here with us and giving us this insight into your work. And um, I would like to give the word to you. Thank you, Adrian, for the invitation and for that very thorough introduction. Um, I'm going to give a very dense talk, so I hope I don't uh, speak too fast. So if I do and I have that tendency, please do let me know. Um, I'm going to start just by uh, sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> uh, it seems like it's not allowing me to, just a second. <laughs> Uh, here we go. Okay, so you can see the screen now, correct? Correct. Okay, great. Okay, um, so as I was saying, this is going to be a pretty dense uh, talk, um, a talk that I've uh, that I've given before, but every time I give it, I kind of add on to it. And it's, I like giving it because it kind of shows the progression of my work and the ways in which one work bleeds into the next, um, and how this kind of research practice builds um, throughout as, as a thread throughout throughout my work. So you'll notice that um, this presentation actually covers quite a few of my works and I will lead to basically how I got to this project Operation Sunken Sea that Adrian you were talking about. Um, and so for me, this is a kind of a good starting point. Um, and it kind of deals with my fascination um, and interest in intervening in history um, and looking at historical narratives um, that are not part of the dominant narrative. And so this is actually um, a photograph. In fact, it's an engraving of a photograph um, of the first documented photograph taken on the African continent, which dates from November 7th, uh, 1839. And that was merely three months after France introduced the daguerreotype camera to the world. And this photo was actually taken in Alexandria by French painter Horace Berni, along with his nephew. And they captured the exterior of Muhammad Ali Pasha's palace harem, or harem palace, I should say. Um, and even though there was nothing erotic about the image, it became a sensation in Paris by igniting fa fantasies about what French viewers envisioned as a subjective subject matter. So the idea was that the Europeans had fantasized about North African women as being part of this harem and in their imagination, this was like a sexual orgy or something like that. And so just the mere act of taking a photograph of the building in which the harem lives was considered something very exciting. And so Horace Verny um, and his nephew were both kind of proponents of the civilizing mission. Um, and this is basically the European rationale that supported racist ideals about white superiority and colonization. So becoming civilized was to renounce native traditions. Um, and, and ironically, as Europeans rushed to capture these ancient architectural marvels in Africa um, on film, they perceived themselves as exceptionally cultured. Um, and so this is something I'm, I'm quite interested in, in critiquing. And so Vernet documented um, his travels extensively, both through photography uh, and writing. And him and his nephew were, quote, glad to think that under the growing influence of French civilization, the region's slumbering reason will be awakened. So again, I look at these kinds of historical documentation and quotes as kind of a joke, actually. Um, and so 
the story of the daguerreotype on the African continent entails this, as I was saying, erotic fantasy that was embedded in the colonial imagination. Um, and due to this inaccessibility of the North African female subject, um, European artists in particular invented this idea of romance by photographing the native woman to fit their vision, um, which was essentially a fabricated delusion. So interestingly, when they actually got to North Africa, this is kind of more commonly the image that they came across. Um, and a woman who is actually completely opaque and, and, um, and, and covered. Uh, and uh, Franz Fanon famously said that the occupier was bent on unveiling Algeria. Um, and so specifically of French photographers in Algeria. And the, the North African women became this focus of the European fantasy, subject to a degrading stereotyping of women's bodies. So when they didn't find the images that they had fantasized about for maybe 200 years, um, they decided to construct them. And so they constructed um, initially these, these kind of fantasies through Orientalist paintings. Um, and, and in fact, these paintings were used as a tool of, of political propaganda for the colonial project. Um, and so sexualized representations of women came to represent the domination of territory. And so their exploited bodies merged with the idea of claiming land. And so, as I said, because they didn't find the figures that they were looking for, they decided to contrive them basically. Um, and so they would stage these uh, photographs uh, oftentimes with poor women, uh, with prostitutes and, and kind of have them pose in these sexualized um, uh, poses. And they would disseminate these photographs in the form of postcards. And so it was a quick and easy way to disseminate images of propaganda, um, basically the propaganda of sexual desire. So many of these postcards are clearly pornographic and quite a few are obviously posed to be explicitly sensual, um, sort of similar to pinup photos. And so I like to refer to this famous image um, by Albrecht Dürer, draftsman drawing a recumbent woman from 1525. Um, because I think it does a really nice job of illustrating the conquering of bodies. Um, and that's often not how this photograph is, or this, uh, sorry, this, um, this illustration is addressed. It's often addressed to, to talk about um, the artist's tool um, in the role of, of changing the perspective and the ways in which we are now able to kind of visualize space through a kind of a, of a, of a perspective. And that tool is the grid um, that you see in the middle of the illustration. So it's a device though, that's used to transform human figures into subjects um, in this particular image. And here the artist is positioned in this dominant role um, both over the subject and the space. And the grid becomes a tool of power that puts into question the sovereignty of the body itself. And so in turn, it establishes control over its mobility. Um, and so the grid transforms imperceptible bodies and subjectivities into subjects. It classifies them into groups, groups into a territory. So basically the woman becomes scrutinized through this Cartesian coordinate system and it's not unlike the mapping and surveying of land. And so I think quite ironically, um, I'm always kind of dumbfounded by the fact that the narrative of the imposition on the woman's body in this particular image is often left out of the narrative of that particular illustration. And so it's also important to note the ways in which photography in particular as a tool and as a technological device was being used in certain geographies. Um, and so in particular in Africa, photography was utilized as this tool to visualize the vast scale of territory that was available for occupation. So depicting the land as this vast open territory was again an act intended as an act um, upon this colonial desire for openness of primitive African landscapes where this new aesthetic of fantasy geographies was at the core of visualizing the colonial project. And so in these particular pictures, um, we have a missionary, a German missionary who was also a photographer by the name of Karl Hugo Hahn, 
who had developed a technological device. And it was basically a camera with a revolving panoramic lens. And it was capable of photographing 180 degree landscapes for the purpose of visualizing this extensive, ex expansive environment. And so it's as if the African landscape wasn't vast enough. He wanted to make it look even more vast to invite um, basically Europeans to colonize um, uh, these territories. And so what interests me about Venus' photograph of the Pasha's harem or the so-called Pasha's harem is that while these hierarchical relations are in place, the bodies themselves are invisible. So the harem is not actually pictured here. And, but the idea of the women is implied through the voyeuristic gaze of the technological device. So even Vernet alludes to this predatory manner of his photographic excursions, and particularly in Egypt. And he says, quote, they were daguerreotyping like lions. So he attempts to capture something intimate, something uh, that Europeans didn't have access to, and the viewer is prompted to look through the windows of the palace itself and see if they too can sneak a glimpse of, of the harem. And of course, you can't. <laughs> um, so it came to be that this first image on the African continent was taken to fulfill a sexual fantasy. And instead, we're presented with an Italian Renaissance palace in Alexandria, a stand-in for the masculine imaginary. And the women are not only implied in the image, they are implied in the landscape itself. Um, and so they become, they become the landscape. So I'm gonna jump very quickly to um, kind of this other thread of um, relating to the Statue of Liberty and you'll see how they're connected. Um, and in 1875, uh, the proposal for the Statue of Liberty was announced uh, and fundraising began, um, led by the friend politician, uh, La Boulaye. And before the statue's design had been finalized, um, French sculptor Bartholdi had built the head and torch bearing right arm and put them on display at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia in 1876 and the Paris World Fair in 1878 to drum up support for the project. Um, the neoclassical statue uh, was designed in the image of Libertas, the Roman goddess of freedom, raising a torch and bearing a tabula ansata representing law. Bartholdi toyed with the idea of having the statue hold a broken chain, but feared that such an explicit reference to slavery might be controversial. So the reason I bring this up because, is because Bartholdi particularly fantasized about um, this kind of, he had a fascination with ancient architecture and colossal structures. And he had this fantasy about reconstructing the Colossus of Rhodes um, after a visit, in fact, to Abu Simbel in, northern, in, in Southern Egypt in Northern Africa in 1955. Uh, sorry, not 1955, 1855. And at the time um, he had actually initially channeled that passion into a proposal for the inauguration of the Suez Canal. So in case you didn't know it, the Statue of Liberty was actually originally proposed for Egypt and not for the US. And Bartholdi had envisioned a colossal monument featuring a robe clad woman from North Africa at the, at, to stand at the Port Said and the city, um, the city at the Northern terminus of the canal in Egypt. And um, to prep for this undertaking, Bartholdi studied the Colossus of Rhodes, um, honing the concept for a figure called Libertas who would stand at the canal. Um, and so this is a quote from him where it says, she's taking the form of a veiled peasant woman, a gift of friendship from the people of France and is recognized a, as a universal symbol of freedom. And later on, it was added when he kind of transformed her to uh, the Statue of Liberty that she would represent freedom and democracy. Um, and so as we know, the statue became an icon of freedom and a sort of welcoming site to immigrants arriving to the United States from abroad. Um, I wonder how many Americans would feel if they knew that she was meant to be uh, an Egyptian woman. 
Um, and so this is the patent that he then created when he reconstructed her image to suit the purpose of um, the United States. And essentially when he had proposed her to, uh, to Egypt, at the time the Egyptian economy uh, was not doing so well, they had just built the Suez Canal and the, and the proposal was rejected. So essentially Bartholdi traveled around the world, basically shopping for space. Uh, looking for where his colossus could exist in the world um, until he landed on um, the United States. So this is connected because in 2014, um, I took a five month road trip from Lagos, Nigeria to Berlin along contemporary migration routes. And basically the project was about borders and migration was an attempt to kind of understand this experience and the landscape and the geography that young African migrants or African migrants were traveling and traversing through to get to Europe um, and what that narrative might be. And so of course you can imagine that this is kind of a problematic project. Of course, who am I to tell the story of a migrant's harrowing story uh, trying to migrate to, to Europe? Um, but I, I was kind of really intrigued by the idea and kind of troubled by it at the same time and trying to figure out actually, how do I become a part of a narrative that can relay something new um, that goes beyond the media narrative. And oftentimes my work really um, uh, responds to media narratives. And my interest is kind of bringing nuance and historical context um, kind of injected into those narratives. So my idea initially um, was to address this bureaucracy of borders through the frameworks of citizenship, marriage, and language. And it was also merely because for me as an Egyptian woman, as an Egyptian passport holder, um, I uh, had great difficulty in, um, in actually attempting to make this trip in the first place. I had to apply for 12 visas um, before I could actually take this trip. And I kept thinking about the ways in which if I had a European passport, um, that it would be much easier for me to travel through my own continent as a former colonizer than it is as a native. And so I thought about this idea of marriage. And if I were married, uh, I could get that European, uh, that European uh, uh, passport. And so I started thinking about um, you know, the, the frameworks of bureaucracy and to, to kind of challenge this perception of this cold, faceless and overly complicated structures of bureaucracy by uncovering a sort of intimacy in an otherwise impersonal system. So this idea of crossing borders as an intimate act of granting entrance. Um, and, and basically with these very kind of grossly unbalanced power structures at play. And so for this trip, as I said, I had to face this overwhelming repetition of power because um, I had to apply for 12 visas in order to complete my journey. And as I was going through this process, I was amazed at the cliches that unfolded um, in these bureaucratic institutions. As a single woman with an Egyptian passport, I was handing over all my data. And I was completely, I was constantly confronted with this lack of agency I had and the power games I had to play in order to be granted entrance. Um, and in fact, in many cases, um, uh, there was also a very kind of uh, uncomfortable power dynamic at these, um, at my interviews to get these visas. Um, I was invited to a marriage seminar because one of the uh, 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 officers at the embassy noticed that I was in my mid thirties and, and not married. I was pursued by another officer on Facebook and asked out on a date. And, and so I was constantly being confronted with this kind of complete lack of agency I had as a, as a single woman. So um, in attempt to problematize and broaden this kind of very narrow, narrow scope of how we talk about contemporary crises, I, I was uh, particularly inspired and continue to be inspired throughout a lot of my work by Japanese filmmaker Masao Adachi and his landscape theory, uh, which suggests that the landscape around us is an expression of the dominant political power. And while doing my research on the history of geography in West Africa and the territories that I was going to be traveling through, I came across this 
peculiar text, um, an Arab Andalusian geographer by the name of Al Bakri and his 11th century manuscript called the Book of Roads and Kingdoms. And basically it's the first comprehensive text, um, uh, comprehensive description of West Africa under the Islamic empire. And I was really drawn to the kind of lyrical style of the text, which compiles accounts of merchants, travelers, traders, um, describing the cities and the towns that they encounter along their journeys. Um, so if any of you have ever read Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities, it's a complete ripoff of 11th century manuscripts. Um, and I found the interesting, the ways in which the objectify, objectification of women's bodies is incorporated into the notion of geography and how the sexual description of their physical appearances became embedded. So in fact, a lot of these travelers and merchants that were traveling relayed their stories to Al Bakri, this Andalusian geographer who never traveled these territories and he just recorded them and compiled them in a book. But in the descriptions were also descriptions and quite sexually explicit descriptions of women's bodies that these traders and merchants and travelers had encountered. So just to give you an example of one of them, Abu Rastam al-Nafusi, who's one of the merchants of Adagast informed me that he saw one of these women reclining on her side and her child, an infant, played with her, passing under her waist from side to side without her having to draw away from him at all on account of the ampleness of the lower part of her body and the gracefulness of her waist. Now I've chosen a kind of more politically correct one, but many of these descriptions are quite explicit. I mean, they go into depth about what their pubic hair looks like, um, what their breasts look like. And so I was really astounded that this is somehow part of um, a scientific text. And so I was also thinking a lot about a work that had a profound impact on me by American artist, Jill Maggot. Um, if you're not familiar with her work, I highly recommend that you look her up. And this was a work that she did in 2004 called Evidence Locker. And at the time um, she was doing a project in Liverpool. And at the time Liverpool had the highest concentration of CCTV cameras in the world. And so she initiated this really intriguing project where she um, initiated a, a sort of relationship or correspondence with a CCTV camera officer. And she had him navigate her around the city blindfolded through CCTV cameras. And so the project is quite interesting. It's a video of her walking around in this red trench coat and he kind of tells her how to navigate the city. And as she goes into interior spaces where he can no longer see her, she documents quite intimately what she's doing in the interior spaces. So it kind of relays this intimate relationship that she has with the surveillance camera officer, but puts him in the position kind of of the voyeur and essentially of the state being a pervert, basically. <laughs> And so I was really fascinated by the way that she was able to subvert that, um, that power dynamic. And so this was something that really stuck with me and I was thinking as I was preparing for this journey. And so another thing that I did um, while I was on this journey was I visited centers of cartography in all the cities um, I was visiting not realizing that this was really a kind of a radical act. In fact, in many cases, they accused me of being a spy because why would I be interested in looking at maps of West Africa? Um, and only to discover really that the sensitivity has a lot to do with the fact that, of course, a lot of the conflicts that exist um, on the continent are due to the ways in which borders have been drawn. And so the power is in the hands of whoever draws these maps. And of course, in many of these countries, these maps continue to be drawn by their so-called former colonizers. Um, so you can somehow see that this is still a form of colonization. And I was also thinking a lot about how do I document this experience? Because I was actually really troubled by the camera and specifically troubled by you know, the brief history I told you about at the beginning of um, how the camera was utilized on the African continent. So I you know, embedded into that technological tool are in these histories that are already inscribed, um, these histories of violence, these histories of power. And so I felt well, like, well, if I point my camera at a migrant body, that somehow imposes that violence again. 
And so I was really troubled by that. And so I was trying to think of, you know, alternative ways to do that. And I came across a theodolite in Mali that I decided to purchase. And if you don't know, a theodolite is basically an engineer's tool. It's a telescopic device um, that's used to measure the level of the land. Um, and it's essentially the device that's used before, you know, you construct anything. And you still see a lot of these engineers on their tripods in the middle of the street sometimes. And so I was like, well, that would be interesting for me to then photograph through this device, only to discover, to discover that this device is somehow much more problematic than a camera. Um, and the reason is, is because um, it's a telescopic device with crosshairs on it. And the crosshairs are used to measure, but it's somewhat a predecessor to, milita to telescopic military technology. So, What's kind of uh, uncomfortable about it is if you look through it, I can, you know, I can see at a very far distance and I can point it at a body and that body wouldn't know that I'm anywhere in that vicinity. But on top of that, I'm, po I'm, I'm pointing a crosshair at that body. So it's as if I'm setting myself up to shoot them. And so it was really kind of putting myself in this position of, of violence. And so, um, so I started looking at the, then the history of, you know, this tool and who's being, who's used this tool and how is this tool being used um, and to, and, and this kind of fetishization of technology at the expense of certain people. And so, of course, I found also a lot of these studio portraits um, from the early 20th century, late 19th century of, um, you know, geographers and surveyors and engineers posing with their technological devices. So I started to then mimic the same, um, that same language essentially of, of these devices. And so these are, these are what the images look like. And again, drawing from Masao Adachi's landscape theory, um, I was, I was very uncomfortable with pointing it at bodies, like I said. And in fact, I felt that that was the same kind of exploitation, eroticization of not just these early photographs that I shared with you, but also the media. In fact, the media addresses the current migration crisis through this kind of um, eroticization of the African body. And so I decided to use Adachi's um, uh, method of, of looking at what can I gain or understand from the landscape itself. And so I started to photograph basically landscapes that were um, critical in the migrant route. Um, and so these could be borders where migrants are stuck. These could be neighborhoods where they're living for extended periods of time before they move on. These could be places where they're being detained, places where migrants have been killed. Um, and uh, fences that separate Africa from the Spanish territory on the African continent, Ciota. Um, and, and kind of gave me, it allowed me this access to conflict zones without having to embed myself into those, um, in, in those regions, but also placing me and having this awareness of my positionality in the, in the process as the voyeur, like what I flipped the narrative of kind of putting myself in that position of imposing that violence. So it really led me to think about, um, you know, what happens um, you know, really kind of exploring this idea of optics and the ways in which optics inscribes narrative into images. And so if you look at this kind of video, which is just simply Africans on a boat, when it's filmed this way through this kind of voyeuristic gaze, I'm spying, um, and in the context of the media narrative of the migration context, it suddenly becomes something totally different. Like the first thing that probably comes to your mind is the is uh, the migration crisis, um, and so I felt like I couldn't explore that without putting myself in front of the lens. And so this is footage of me on a boat traveling across the Mediterranean in a way that many migrants couldn't. Um, but also, if you look very closely at this image, you can see this crosshair. I don't know if you can see it from your computer. And so again, it's seeing myself and my face. Um, and it looks like somebody's about to about to shoot me. And so it's it was this kind of hyper awareness of, of the ways in which the image is really used to kind of manipulate those narratives. 
So in thinking kind of more thoroughly about the Mediterranean and this contemporary story of the Mediterranean, um, I, I again found this, um, this other interesting manuscript. This one's from the 10th century. Um, and it was, it's a book uh, from the El Belki school of geographers. And basically they were illustrating the, again, the world under the Islamic empire, but with the Mediterranean at its center. And so this here is a map of the Mediterranean Sea. And I found this map incredibly fascinating because um, you see that all the blue territory, that's the sea and the triangle in the middle is the Strait of Gibraltar with Africa below it, Europe above it. And to the right is Turkey and the Bosphorus and to the bottom right is the Levant. And I was really fascinated with this idea of the, the Mediterranean being the center of the world. And the, and the way in which it's depicted here, it's kind of the positive space where everything around it is kind of the negative space. And it really kind of stands in opposition to how we consider the Mediterranean today, which is as a border, as a wall, as a, as a space in which migrants are drowning. Um, and so I was, I was fascinated by that kind of shift in, um, in the construct of thinking about that particular territory. And so in digging a little bit further uh, in the Mediterranean, I came across this interesting article, in fact, from 1912 uh, by the Scientific American. And it's a proposal for, for converting the Sahara Desert into a sea. And it's an extensive uh, proposal from the mid 19th century uh, by a French geographer, essentially to funnel the Mediterranean into North Africa and particularly that time into Algeria because Algeria was a French colony as a solution to dealing with the Arab problem. And so their idea was to flood the territory to push the Arabs and Tuaregs further south so that they can lay claim to the territory more easily. And I was really struck by the audacity of this and, and, and kind of intrigued to look further into it, only to discover that in fact, Jules Verne wrote his last book about this exact proposal and it's called uh, Invasion of the Sea. Uh, and this was the last book he wrote from 1905 um, before he died. Uh, and this goes into a great uh, detail about this, this particular proposal, but being presented as this completely revolutionary, revolutionary idea and not necessarily through a critical lens. And when I dug further, I discovered that in fact, this was not the only proposal. Uh, and I started to discover more proposals that were similar. And this particular one is by a German engineer from the 1920s, his name is Hermann Zergel, um, who proposed to um, this time, not necessarily flood North Africa, but to evaporate the Mediterranean Sea by building hydroelectric dams, um, particularly the main one being across the Strait of Gibraltar to stop the Atlantic Ocean from funneling into the Mediterranean Sea. And in the course of 150 years, the Mediterranean would evaporate and turn Africa and Europe into one continent. And so the idea behind this is that he proposes it as a sort of engineering uh, utopia where we're gonna, the two continents are gonna be utilizing uh, hydroelectric power. And at the same time, um, Europe has easier accessibility to Africa's resources while um, Africa benefits from learning from European civilization. Uh, that, that's, that's the trade-off. <laughs> and so, and he was very adamant about not presenting it as a colonial project. Rather, this is a world building project. This is a peaceful project. This is a project of collaboration. Um, and it's especially astounding when you look at his illustrations <laughs> that are particularly racist. And yet he kind of does, is very adamant about not presenting them this way. And what's interesting is this leading up to the, um, to the 1930s and the, um, the power that was being gained by the right and the Nazis, um, he was trying to get the support of the Nazis. And in fact, the Nazis actually hated this project. Um, and uh, they were not interested in it at all. And in fact, they did, uh, they attempted to compromise it. And the reason it was a bit threatening 
was because, um, in fact, he had a big following and a huge support, and especially from uh, European intellectuals and from people like Le Corbusier, surprise, surprise. And, um, and uh, but he kind of lucked out that the Nazis didn't like his project because then he kind of disassoci disassociated his, himself from them. But he basically spent his lifetime on this project, figuring it out and planning it out. Um, he would build a canal from Berlin to Cape Town with reservoirs in the middle to make Africa more beautiful and more appealing for European colonizers uh, and et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, he has one of the most extensive um, archives at the um, Deutsches Museum in, in Munich. And so again, I was like, what is the audacity of this? And a German, why a German? Like, what does he have to do with the Mediterranean? Um, and so I was really thinking about like, what, where is this megalomania coming from? And what is this megalomania about? Um, and really kind of thinking towards that, the, the ideology and, and the framing of that time period. And here you have an image from the Berlin Conference from 1884 to 85, also known as the Congo Conference or the West Africa Conference, uh, which basically regulated European coloniza colonization and trade in Africa during this new imperialism period, which coincided with Germany's sudden emergence as an imperial power. And so, um, so again, I'm, I'm really thinking about, so who is claiming these narratives? Who is claiming these territories? Um, and who's coming up with these, with these ideas? So I, I became fascinated by, by the megalomania behind it and decided, you know what? I'm gonna write myself into that lineage um, because I wanna see what that feels like to kind of propose such, a, such an absurd project. And so I decided, um, to come up with my own proposal. I proposed to drain the Mediterranean Sea. And in the context of the contemporary migration crisis, I'm, I'm proposing it as, to, as a solution um, to reclaim this territory from the African continent so that uh, African bodies are no longer drowning um, in mass uh, in the sea. And so what's the first thing to do? And it's to establish this bureaucratic office. And so I basically launched the project in Malta and Malta being kind of a, a significant uh, uh, location because according to several of the proposals, when the, sea, when the Mediterranean Sea sinks, the first land bridge between Africa and Europe is Malta. And so imagine kind of presenting to the Maltese people through a TV broadcast that I'm, I'm proposing to drain the Mediterranean Sea that their identity is completely wrapped up in. Um, also important is to establish a logo or an identity for the project. So I borrow from this 10th century map that I was so kind of um, uh, amused by, and this becomes the logo of the project. I start to explore aesthetics of what it means to be this a megalomaniac. And so I'm borrowing from fascist aesthetics. And so this is kind of borrowing from um, the Palazzo della Civilità Italiana um, and looking at fascist architecture and the ways in which they are using ideology um, uh, to, as propaganda. And so in fact here, I don't know if you're familiar with the inscription on the top of that building but it says a nation of poets, of artists, of heroes, of saints, of thinkers, of scientists, of navigators, of transmigrators. I'm not sure what transmigrators means, but interesting. But I started looking at mottos that um, fascists, right-wing um, uh, uh, groups are using and drain the swamp. Um, if you're familiar with it, uh, many of you perhaps um, know it from Trump, but in fact, this is a, a motto that comes from Mussolini. Um, it was part of the, um, uh, his role in, uh, in draining the Pontine marshes, which was one of the first kind of examples of biological warfare and malaria. Interesting story if you want to look into it further. I looked at kind of um, particular fascist ideologies like make the desert bloom, which also originates from uh, Mussolini and the fascists, but also Zionists and this idea of um, 
taking an abandoned desert landscape and injecting it with civilization and making it bloom um, as a way of claiming it. Um, so again, in the case of Africa and especially North Africa, where a lot of those territories are desert territories, it's this assumption that nobody lives in the desert, um, which of course we know is not true. And then I was looking at the civilizing mission, which is a colonial motto of, again, we'll bring civilization to Africa. And then looking at a, a, a motto, actually a, a particularly interesting one by Gaddafi, um, uh, where he refers to the canal of paradise after he uh, discovers fossilized water, um, fresh water that's fossilized since the ice age uh, underneath the ground, uh, that he spent 40 years building a sort of irrigation system and uh, canal system uh, to extract water. And then in 2011, when the Arab Spring erupted and he was killed, NATO bombed the entire infrastructure with the ex excuse that uh, militants were hiding in it. So I know I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna kind of speed through this, but I've been really thinking about this idea of what it means to document history and who gets to write histories. And of course, this is a topic that's very present at the moment. And I'm, I'm very kind of drawn to this quote by Bill Ashcroft, where he says, history is neither the opposite of fiction, nor is it simply fictional. History is a method rather than a truth, an institutional formalization of the stories we tell ourselves to make sense of our lives. And so when I look at the ways in which history is documented, and this is a portrait of Hermann Zergo um, that I believe was taken by Time magazine um, at the height of this kind of megalomaniac project, and I, I consider ways in which in my intervention of writing myself into these lineage, what are the tools that I have to overwrite these narratives? Well, essentially it's to, the attempt is to erase these figures from history by not only appropriating their content, but writing myself into it and, um, and dominating the, um, the digital algorithm of, of how these things are discovered. And so now when you look up Hermann Zergel, um, increasingly my image is the one that appears instead of his. Um, but then how do I kind of transform myself also um, to kind of use this performative methodology um, and learn, uh, learn through the kind of performances of existing figures. Um, so in the middle, you see uh, an image of me um, giving a live performance uh, again in Malta about draining the Mediterranean Sea, but I'm performing this kind of contemporary political performance. Um, so I can send you links to some of the videos because I don't think that we have time right now, but just to kind of wrap this up, I started to question, so what is this future female? I mean, what does it mean for me to kind of enact these, um, this kind of political propaganda? What does it mean for me to use these ideologies and flip them? What does it mean for me to give a speech about draining the Mediterranean Sea, but as an, as an Arab, as an African, as a woman and not these white male figures? Um, does it give, give me any agency um, in, 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 in that narrative? Can I, can I truly write them out of history? Um, and that then becomes the kind of intervention that I'm attempting to make. And so the speech that I've given is a live speech that I gave to a live audience in Malta. And it's a completely plagiarized speech. And I've basically grabbed from historical speeches that relate to the, nar the narrative of the Mediterranean and have pieced them together to suit my narrative but none of the words are my own. So what does it mean to utter these, these words um, from kind of previous politicians? And in, and in performing that, I realized the ways in which the language and the ideology of what this kind of utopian future is has really not changed. And our imagination has really not changed in maybe about 150 years, if not more. And so, in, in kind of thinking of the future, again, what is this future female? And this is the figure that I come up with. Um, and this is a, a, an image of Sophia, the robot, in case you don't know her again, you should look her up. And she is the creation of AI developer, David Hansen um, uh, at Hansen Robotics. And he states, quote, we feel that for realistic robots to be appealing to people, 
robots must attain some level of integrated social responsivity and aesthetic refinement, he wrote. Rendering the social um, human in all possible detail can help us to better understand social intelligence, both scientifically and artistically. But interestingly, Sophia is a white woman who's designed to look like Audrey Hepburn. And he describes her as having porcelain skin, a slender nose, high cheekbones, an intriguing smile, and deeply expressive eyes that, seems, that seem to change color with the light. This is his description. They describe her as having simple elegance and hope that this approachability will go some way to her acceptance in the public sphere. Hansen, uh, by the way, used to work for Disney. And so I leave you with this image, <laughs> which I think is very appropriate. She also has a sense of humor and her artificial intelligence is designed around human values like wisdom, kindness, and compassion. And basically she is another version of the Western imaginations, perhaps to emancipate the Arab woman. And I say that because Sophia has recently become the first robot to receive citizenship. And who does she see receive citizenship from? Um, Saudi Arabia. And so that if that's not ironic, I don't know what is. And so kind of through this transgression of looking at the female figure and the subjectivity of the female figure in these geographies through technologies and through this kind of element of performativity, I'm looking at what does it mean um, to be a citizen? And especially in the case of Sophia, she kind of brings up all these questions again. You know, what rights does Sophia hold as a robot? Um, of course, Saudi Arabia hasn't elaborated on this so far. Um, but, but again, my, my idea is to think through these kinds of absurd narratives that are constantly happening. Um, uh, you know, none of these, I'm not making up any of these narratives, but through this approach of performativity and appropriation, what can we glean um, from, uh, from this kind of um, perspective. If I present it to you in this kind of absurd way and we can kind of laugh about it, have a sense of humor about it, can we then extract something more meaningful as a form of emancipation, as a form of criticality and as a way of perhaps changing the way that we move forward and think about the future? And I think my time is exactly on point. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Heba, for this um, great lecture, presentation. It was quite a, a wild uh, journey, one might say, from uh, starting as a, let's almost kind of a sans-papier uh, status of um, having to consult marriage courses to be able to travel to your own continent to then become basically um, the despot of that continent and finally uh, even a cyborg um, yeah woman um, i think i'll try and open first for questions if there are any questions in the group please um, feel free switch on your microphone So I guess there's no questions. Everything is clear. So well, yeah. either that or I'm just like a really scary woman dictator. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I what I uh, what struck I, I heard a part of the presentation already before, and what uh, what I've been trying to take notes and uh, with a, a note I took a couple of times was this idea of um, of the role of different kinds of tools. And how, what kind of role these tools, like the camera or the, how was it called, the theodolite telescope mm. device, um, what kind of role these tools play in, in basically, one could say, writing history and in, in defining a, a certain image of history. Mm -hmm. And now you end with uh, Sophia, 
the wisdom you know? uh, and I was wondering is like because she in that sense could be a, a, um, a mix between what you described at the beginning of this the object uh, the, the woman female uh, body as an objectification of uh, the colonial um, possibility of conquering uh, all of Africa and now suddenly we have this which was basically two sides let's say the camera and the the, the woman we have now in one tool so to say mm -hmm. so um, I was wondering uh, yeah is that a little bit your your kind of arch of the of the story you were telling us. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. But also the ways in which these biases are inscribed into those tools. So who is Sophia being created by? I think it's very important, this description I gave at the end of her creator mm -hmm. who creates her as, I mean, I mean, let's have a look at this image here. This is really like a, a <laughs> embodiment of some kind of sexualized fetish. <laughs> you know, um, that's being inscribed to uh, artificial intelligence. And you start to think about the ways in which our world is being constructed through these techno utopias um, without any regard for in fact, who those techno utopias are um, uh, subjecting power onto. And so, you know, the draining the Mediterranean Sea is a good example of that, because if you look at um, where those fast, you know, where those fascination that where that fascination comes from of conquering people conquering bodies conquering land and framing it as technological advancement and technological utopia we've been doing that since the mid 19th century if not earlier uh, earlier much earlier but if we're kind of talking about these advanced technologies the theodolite is the same thing i mean i started looking at um, the ways in which uh, that tool um, inscribes a power dynamic over bodies. And that's why finding this 11th century text was a fascinating find for me because somehow it illustrated very clearly this idea that I had that um, there's uh, automatically this kind of, um, in that case, a gender hierarchy that's being built into the tools. Um, and so I think in my work, I'm constantly thinking about how those tools write those narratives. And as an artist, I'm interested in using those same tools to try to uh, regain agency um, through those tools, or at the very least reveal um, those embedded hier hierarchies in a way that's obvious. Um, and so when I perform this dictator uh, 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 character, it's absurd, it's ridiculous. But why is it ridiculous? I mean, why it's not more ridiculous than any of these other dictators, you know? But somehow there's something that it reveals um, in many ways. I mean, for me, it becomes a tool for learning by performing. I begin to understand better how these incentives and these how the rhetoric is used and how the performance is used when i gave my speech in malta i worked with an acting coach to figure out what could i get away with and i studied hundreds of hours of political speeches to understand what the strategies that speech givers use but then specifically how do women embody those and i and i discover that women have a very different strategy of giving speeches I borrow a lot from Mussolini and I could never perform a speech like Mussolini. I would never get away with that. And so I start to also realize the ways in which um, the performance of gender also becomes a part of it. Um, so it's not only that, I, that I'm that i then um, disadvantaged by my gender, but also by my geography. And so, um, so I'm using these tactics to regain that power basically. Maybe I was thinking of um, Kafka and his, uh, I don't know the English word, uh, machine celibataire, and his uh, colony. Um, he describes like a, this idea of Marcel Duchamp and uh, other male avant garde artists using the celibatary machine. Is it called like that? Or machine celibataire? Like the, uh -huh. um, and in a way, I, I was thinking of this idea that a lot of these tools you're describing are to a certain degree kind of um, how do you say celebratory machines no? that they uh, are kind of um, how would you say dealing with the compensation of um, 
of not, of trying to uh, rule over this um, female bodies, starting with the first images until this last one. And of course, it's a lot of engineer and nerds who like to build um, celibatary machines. Yeah, but I would take it a step further and really say that technologies are constructed through political ideology. And so the political ideology is inscribed into technology. There's no such thing as a neutral technology. Um, and oftentimes they kind of take it to as far as presenting them as emancipatory tools, but emancipatory for who? Um, if you look at our kind of contemporary context and think about the ways in which we engage with technology, um, a lot of our decisions are being dictated by algorithms and who's writing those algorithms and who do those algorithms serve? And now algorithms are writing algorithms for algorithms. And so, you know, how do we, how do we assess like where the bias is written into it? When we have a contemporary context uh, of drone warfare where drones are dictated by by algorithms that are deciding uh, uh, based on data that we have no idea, um, but to target a particular type of person. Um, if that's not raising alarm bells, then I don't know what is. Mm. And so I think um, one of the things I attempt to do with my work, because these are very difficult topics to, um, to penetrate. And um, sometimes they're even risky to talk about. And especially if you, come from the region that I come from. Um, and so I've really kind of discovered the power of artistic practice as a tool um, to um, not just criticize those things, but uh, as a tool to investigate them. I mean, these are very complex ideas that uh, unless you're embedded with them, I think are very difficult to wrap your head around. And so my practice becomes about a way of understanding, you know, where those power dynamics are, um, integrated through kind of technological uh, infrastructures. And mm -hmm. so really that's the thread of my work. I mean, even if it's kind of performing politics um, or kind of investigating early photographs, it really is about the power dynamic of technology. Um, I will open it up again. Are there any questions in the, in the group? There are already a few comments. Heba. Mm -hmm. um, Kata says that she likes very much how you use tools themselves to expose the system. And it reminds her of the concept of minor literature. Is this something that you would like to comment upon or Kata, if you'd like to, to jump in? Sorry, the concept of what? Of minor literature. What's the concept of minor literature? literature from miners like the coal miners or, or, or uh, no sorry um, it's a, the concept of uh, Deleuze and Guattari um, in which uh, well uh, minor literature is is uh, it, it's kind of a metaphor um, in which uh, uh, the literature they start from the the example of the um, I can't really remember uh, the the kind of literature that that uh, that a minority makes and uh, okay. use, use the, the major uh, discourse and the major context in a different way and uh, mm -hmm. or they change the whole language mm -hmm. they use it incorrectly in a way. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, this kind of brings up the issue of Audre Lorde's um, master's tools, right? Can you use the tools of oppressor, colonizer, power um, to emancipate yourself? Or do you have to build completely other kind of parallel systems to, to have that kind of emancipation? And I think that's a question that um, I, I, I don't have a definitive answer to, but I think for me, it's a strategy um, especially given how ubiquitous technology is today. Um, in many ways, you can't function outside of that system anymore uh, if you wanna participate in, in uh, society. Um, and so what are the ways in which we can use those technologies to, to yeah, reveal um, uh, those, those hierarchies that are built into it? So it sounds like there's a learning curve, um, you know, like inside of your practice coming from, you know, like the different uh, works that you showed. 
And um, I was asking myself, is there maybe a point where it leads to um, not just the disruption of the systems, but also like the, the construction? Do you see like a future in that? Well, I mean, I think that's why I do what I do. I mean, I, research is research practice is, I think, at the core of my practice. So in that sense, it's very much about a learning process. And I present these ideas, not necessarily with in any kind of f fashion to to relay that I know, like I know that I know what I'm talking about. But it's <laughs> but it's more about, um, you know, how to explore these different avenues within these complicated uh, 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 topics, but also how do I, for myself, even it becomes a kind of introspective practice of how do, for myself, how do I understand these constructs better? But also a big part of my practice is also pedagogy. And so through teaching, through collaborative work, um, through engaging with others, um, uh, is kind of breaking apart and, and um, uh, uh, basically um, looking at these dominant narratives through other lenses. Um, and so I think the hope is that absolutely, it's not just about disruption, but it's um, how do you create a community um, that uh, is interested in thinking in similar ways and revealing kind of these underlying um, problems um, to a broader uh, um, audience. And so in that sense, um, I think it has a lot of potential. And there's, and I use that in different strategies, right? I mean, the art world is also quite limiting. So, um, you know, the exhibition space is only one space to do that. But I've also done quite a few work in media. I've done works that have gone viral. Um, I do work in the classroom. I do a lot of teaching. So my interest is really kind of in exploring these very different avenues of how do we, um, explore these ideas. So in a sense, the visual practice and the kind of object, the art object is only one tiny part of my practice. Um, and I wouldn't even say it's the main part, um, but there are all these kind of other parts. I do a lot of public speaking. I, you know, I do a lot of um, collaborative work. I do teaching, I do media, I, you know, so it's, it's really kind of just figuring out what's the best avenue for the particular project. It's a little bit like we were talking recently, basically exhibitions for you are like uh, museums for European colonizers where they just come and show the treasures from their adventurous expeditions. No? Right, and so, and again, so then how do we use museums um, and exhibitions to critique that and transform it. And, and I, I think that's something that is happening very much in the art world. Um, there is a sort of awakening in a way that's happening. How far that goes is questionable. Um, you know, are we kind of in an elitist circle speaking to other elitists um, or are we able to kind of break out of, uh, break out of that mode? So, I had um, a, a small question. Sorry if I'm interrupting anyone. Yeah. Um, which is a question, but also an observation. Mostly, I don't know if we can answer it now. But I was um, also thinking about my context. I'm from Romania. And um, there's always speaking about these landscapes and returning a bit to the beginning of your presentation with um, the postcards and these sort of images traveling the world. Um, there is also sort of this sort of secondhand colonization in the sense that um, a country like Romania, for example, adopted a fashion at a certain time in which many people would hang in their uh, houses, these carpets that would uh, show this exotic, exoticized imageries from the East. Like I remember uh, in one of my friend's grandmother's house that it would be this image of a harem of women smoking, uh, very um, sort of relaxed uh, with this sort of Egyptian uh, oriental landscape in the back. Um, but I wonder if they don't change the meaning somehow, like I said, a sort of secondhand colonialism because we never, we're really colonizers in that part of the world, but we took this imagery and then 
it was also interpreted like these concubines, these smoking women that seemed to be free in a way because they could smoke in public. Well, at the time it wasn't so well regarded in Romania. And later on, people got old with these carpets in their house. And now my generation think that, of course, very problematic, but also very old fashioned. And in a way, it sort of got into this traditional sort of culture that you see in old people's houses. And I wonder if uh, the discourse towards the West uh, could be the same towards these sort of peripheric regions where this sort of secondhand imageries of colonialism arrived and were used. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an that's an excellent question. And I think um, a place that I'd like to start um, in responding to that is I'm, um, this kind of problematic framing of post-colonialism. Um, I, I mean, have we in fact already bypassed this era of colonialism? Um, and I would argue we have not, we're still very much living within it. And so um, when you think about, um, of course, our, our perspective towards these kinds of images shifts based on how we engage with discourse and how we're educated through this just changing discourse. But ultimately, uh, I think we often underestimate the power that these kinds of images um, have and are harmful towards entire groups of people. And the, the people that are being exoticized in those images are still the people that are being victimized through films in Hollywood. Um, and the image may, has, may have changed, but the incentive comes from a very similar place. Um, and so it takes this hyper awareness of how images function, which most people do not have because we're just consuming images constantly, right? And we're not often thinking twice or evaluating the influence that these images have on us. Um, so I think it takes people who, who do invest their time in analyzing that and relaying that and putting that forward, which, you know, I, that's a role that I've kind of taken upon myself that I think is important to play. Um, but it, essentially, I think they're still as problematic as they were then. Thank you very much. I, as, uh, um, yeah, I would like to ask something if we got time. Yeah, we're actually already over time, but uh, oh. if it's a simple question, quickly answer, asked and quickly answered. That's, uh, well, that's the role actually, I, I have upon me to... Um, yeah, to there are the actually two moderator. questions, but um, yeah, I will be quite quickly. Uh, first of all, thank you for the uh, very impressive and amazing work and uh, quite over, overwhelmed in a, in a very positive way. Um, as I see, it's a lot to grasp at, at once, um, but um, what I'm trying to understand about your practice is that you are trying to infiltrate into the system of power, which is a, a patriar patriarchal per se. And um, there is a sense of vulner vulnerability that is coming up all, all the time or that I see very fast in what you've been presenting about your practice. Um, but on that, uh, still, um, I would like to ask you, and, and yeah, it's a kind of complex question anyway, um, it, it's related with your positionality in terms of race, class, uh, gender, and sex, uh, especially in the last performance when you are performing this character as a, as a dictator, let's say, in racist. This is one question. Um, and uh, the other question, um, yeah, deals more with um, if you've been preoccupied because there is something about the visuality and this vertical, patriarchal, very heteronormative way of colonizing the visuals in, that is coming from the Western and you, and you implement through the technologies. But it, it struck me a lot, the image of the harem from the distance, from the outside. So the question is, are you interested maybe in the future to question how, as a woman from Egypt, uh, to, to question how were, was the visual realm of the women inside the harem? What was the power structure with, within them? And what other type of gender relations were there into? Uh, not just the sexual aspect of being 
objects of desire from, from the, let's say the king of the harem, but uh, from the male gaze, but within the women itself, it, is there any structures and are you interested in the, maybe in the future to see these power structures? Those were the questions. Mm. Thank you. Well, I mean, I think they're uh, related questions in the sense that um, my positionality is always something that's at the forefront of the concept of the project. Um, and basically it's uh, often situated in opposition to the issue that I'm dealing with. Um, so um, I'm, you know, I'm working with these technological tools and I see the ways in which the power hierarchy is embedded, whether through its a, a gaze or a political power dynamic. And I flip that to see how it reads from the other side. And it's purely fruit through this kind of very experimentative approach. Um, it's oft, sometimes it, it succeeds and sometimes it completely fails. Uh, but, uh, but important for me at the forefront of all of that to address my position through gender, through class, through geography, all of those things. Um, and that was something that really came through in um, the work uh, of, of the migrant roots because I felt like, well, I mean, I come from this position of privilege. I can take a boat across the Mediterranean when you know the average African cannot. And, um, and so I had to somehow situate that within the narrative to address kind of my privilege in telling that narrative and the fact that I don't want to tell the story on behalf of somebody else whose experience I can't begin to understand. Um, so that certainly is something that I'm often preoccupied with is where do I stand in that narrative? Um, and in relation to the harem, um, you know, uh, I would say not really, I'm not really in, interested in that because anyways, the whole idea behind the harem is a completely contrived idea. Um, and, and what the kind of common knowledge and dominant narrative of a harem and how that's been represented is completely false. Um, and so my interest is much more in, um, in, in changing the discourse about the harem rather than understanding the inner workings of that. Uh, I'm a North African woman. I grew up in, in North Africa. I'm very familiar with what it's like to live as a female in North Africa. Um, and so that's kind of an assumed position that I have. Um, and so, so really my critique is not about that. Uh, and it's rather about how images and visuals are dominating narratives, oftentimes false narratives, um, and how that in turn um, has a very real impact on reality, on the ways in which uh, people engage with the world. Um, and so, uh, so I think my interest in that particular photograph is to just illustrate, I mean, if you look at, at the problems in France today with the veil and the ways in which they've, uh, you know, uh, it, there's a whole debate about whether it should be legal, legal or illegal. And, you know, there's a, there's a huge conflict that's happening right now. That didn't just start two decades ago that started 400 years ago, <laughs> you know, because there has been this kind of systematic degradation of the ways in which that particular body is being represented. And so my interest is really in contextualizing these very real complex contemporary problematic issues that I can speak to and situating them in a, a much more complicated history. Thank you very much, Heba, and thank you. thank you all participants for the Could I add questions. One, one more comment, please. Uh, it's not the only question, but okay, oh, quick question. Quick, quick well, comment. Yeah, quick question. Uh, it's a landscape and a body representation in a political issue reminds me of the book of um, Judy Butler, which is called uh, Frames of War. And I sort of use this uh, telescope, uh, not only as a tool to represent this problem, uh, but also like an uh, active uh, participant of this uh, uh, performative action. Uh, so like this telescopes uh, became like orchestrating uh, this all action mm -hmm. and it uh, frames uh, the whole story. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this case, not only you, but uh, also you, the, the tools that you have chosen 
mm -hmm. uh, the teams that can um, frame in uh, actor. Yeah, absolutely. I think the tools that I use are often also protagonists in my narratives. And that's why it's important for me to understand the history of those tools as well. Okay, I'm very sorry that I have to have this role, but that was and that's what I'm paid for. You know, I'm the course leader, so I have to say now it's time because you're the I'm, dictator in this situation. I'm the dictator, yeah. Uh -huh. Just, uh, but uh, as a dictator, I also have the power to break the rules and ask the question. <laughs> so, no, because uh, I was I also wanted to have you in this as a speaker over here, to um, because as we as we said before a lot of your work doesn't really happen in exhibition so in a way mm -hmm. to try and change the narrative and to inscribe yourself in the algorithm so to say mm -hmm. use the different techniques so mm -hmm. <clears throat> the question is quite simple um where can we find what you have been doing in this relation is it on your uh, website that we can see like not just the exhibitions but also like other kinds of um Project. Yeah, I mean, definitely my work is on my website. I wouldn't say it's so extensive there. Um, and specifically in relation to how I'm trying to dominate the internet. <laughs> I think over time, <laughs> you will see that. Yeah. Um, I think it's just a matter of, you know, maybe every once in a while, Google Herman Zergel and uh, ho uh, hopefully my image starts to dominate that uh, image algorithm. Okay. And soon, we, when we Google Gaddafi, we will see Heba. Soon, I will be all over okay. the place, and then you'll you'll be so sick of my face. Cool. <laughs> Looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Heba, for uh, sharing your work and yes. telling us this uh, beautiful story of dictatorship. <laughs> Thank um, you for the invitation. You're welcome. Thank and, you all uh, so. And we also invite you, Heba, if you'd like to, to join us for the next talks, you are welcome to do that. Sorry for interrupting, Adrian. Thank you. No so theoretically, we have now a five minute break. Is that, um, so Diana let's is make it a 10 minute dictator. break. Okay. Let's, uh, let's uh, break the rules, huh? <laughs> okay. 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 See, See you, everyone. In a moment. See you very soon. Thank, Thank you, you Heba. Thank you.
Carlos, we are having a short break for about uh, seven minutes still, uh, and we are coming back to you. Okay, perfect. I'm here. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
Hello. Hello. Hello, Mr. Amorales. How are you? Good, thank you. Early morning, huh? Yes. I said 3 a.m. for you. Not huh? Yeah, it's 3 a.m. in the afternoon. Yes. So. But I'm awake. You're awake? Cool. <laughs> Do you have a, a presentation or something, or um, we just talk directly to you? I think we just talk. I mean, we can make a recapitulation of the text a bit. Okay. Uh, but if you don't mind, it would be nice if you interact with me. Me? Yeah. Okay. You know, it becomes more <laughs> like a conversation. <laughs> yeah, no, of course. I try to prepare. I mean, in the sense that they, they already uh, read the text, so I don't think I need to repeat it, but maybe just yeah. more, more like a, to give it a small structure. Hello. Yes, maybe uh, it's worth a little bit uh, to expand on it for the wider public that is watching us live. All right. And it has not uh, uh, received the text. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I can't go like on page 27 in line three. What exactly do you mean over there? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so you tell me what to start. Yeah. I think uh, it will be Gia who will tell us when we are online. And I'll make a small introduction first. We are online. Okay. <laughs> Please proceed. Okay. So uh, welcome back to our new now um, Autumn School of Curating, the public part with our six uh, great speakers. Today is basically the artist's day and tomorrow will be the curator's day. So we just heard uh, Heba. Now we will be talking to Carlos Amorales and after that to Zengbo. Uh, I will start by just reading the biography and then adding some personal comments to it, if I may. And the idea of uh, the talk with Carlos is that we will engage on, upon a text that uh, he has sent, but we will try and um, illustrate a little bit what, what the text actually is saying. So Carlos Amorales studied visual arts at the Gerrit Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam and holds an MFA, a Master of Fine Arts, from the Belende Rijksakademie von Kunsten, also in Amsterdam. For more than 10 years, he has developed a liquid archive, a collection of images from books, magazines, and the internet, which he transformed into vector graphics and used as the basis of his own visual language. Using this visual database, the artist has ventured into medium diverse as sculpture, drawing, installation, video, animation, collage, and painting. Through the constant reinterpretation and transformation of images in this archive, Amorales' work became increasingly more abstract, a process he likens to early, he likens to early printing presses. So I know uh, Carlos, I think now it's like almost uh, 12 or 13 years. It was um, in a period where Carlos just finished or ended his um, work with uh, Lucha Libre fighters and started his liquid archive. And I was back then uh, doing an exhibition on a boxer and poet, Arthur Craven, and tried to get Carlos involved, but I failed. And uh, later on, we then made an exhibition together where we went to research different archives here in Europe on Hans Arp, Jean Arp. And the exhibition was called the Skeleton Image Constellation. He has also performed together with his uh, boy band, the Cyclops in Cabo Volta uh, twice uh, already. And um, over there, he tried or we tried together to basically awaken Antonin Arthur's uh, spirit um, in the tomb of Kabarwater in the cave down there. It was a very archaic uh, experience. And 
then uh, the last work we did together in Kawaiwota was a, a poster project, which is called Learn to Fuck Yourself. So it was, we basically plastered all of Kawaiwota um, with drawings, medieval drawings, which we copied from medieval books and with vulgar contemporary language. And I understood the message that Carlos was giving me back then. And so basically after that, I left Gabriel Voltaire and joined the happy uselessness of um, curators and artists. So uh, today we will talk about a text which is entitled The Happy Uselessness of the Artist, which Carlos has written more or less now. So it's basically fresh of print and it describes this is like a very general frame uh, it describes an invitation that Carlos got at, uh, to participate in a biennial in Michoacan um, where he traveled in January uh, for a first research trip it was back then he had the idea to work together with visual artist Guillermo Galindo and uh, after a first research, they also had a first very, um, let's say, general idea what they might be doing back there. And then on a second visit um, during the pandemic lockdown, where Carlos was, as he describes in the text, very um, happy to be able to go outside and to see the horizon after months of just seeing his own walls. Uh, he was then invited to by local artists into uh, a, a town. I can't remember the name right now. Chet, what was the? Chiran. 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 <laughs> Where, um, which is actually an autonomous uh, community um, since 2011. We will, I guess, we will talk a little bit about that. And over there. He got to know uh, the artists who show them around the place and especially through a, a kind of sculpture park um, that remembered or reminded of the, the revolution or the rebellion that happened in 2011. And this moment, one might say, uh, it was a kind of illumination moment for uh, Carlos in, in that uh, forest on different levels, which we hopefully will explore a little bit over here, um, which finally then led to him and um, Guillermo Galindo to propose to the curator of the Biennial, Victor Palacios, to do nothing. Um, yeah, so let's try and uh, reiterate this <laughs> kind of um, frame. Um, and maybe we can start by Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your um, your visits in in Michoacan. Yes, sure. Uh, do you hear me well? I do. Yeah. It's a bit stuck here. <clears throat> uh -huh. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I should give a bit of a context uh, of the state of Michoacán. Mexico City is a republic and it's divided in 32 states now. And <clears throat> Michoacán is about, I mean, it's about two hours, three hours from the city driving. Uh, but the, the way, the place I went is, is about five hours. So it's kind of not really far away. It's not like going to the north or to the south, but still in the central part of Mexico. Uh, but on the other hand, it's a, it's a place that I haven't visited actually uh, before since maybe more than 10 years. And <clears throat> I have to say this because I think one of the interesting things about uh, this visit for me was that uh, we stopped in Mexico City. Most of us stopped visiting the countryside uh, since more or less 2006, 2008, because it's when it started the drug and wars, uh, the war on drugs, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so in a way, going there was like breaking some kind of uh, taboo or some kind of fear, I would say that 
somehow we have grown citizens in, in the last, uh, yeah, almost decade. Uh, also because uh, the thing with Michoacán is, is that it was one of the main, uh, yeah, states where, where the conflict was happening. <clears throat> Part of this conflict is the, is the situation with Cheran. Uh, Cheran, uh, is part of, of, of an Indian, of the town that, that configured uh, an Indian community uh, called the Purepecha community. So it's, it's in, in a plain, kind of in the middle of the state. And what happened there is that it's, it's, it's a town that, that lives from a harvesting forest, you know, it lives from a forest. So what happened is that slowly through a couple of years, uh, mafia groups started to plunder or cut the trees, and they started, let's say, to basically appropriate uh, the forests surrounding the town. So that's, that's what provoked this kind of uh, rebellion, because there was a moment where they could not stand it anymore. And in the morning, uh, the women of the town, they, they got together and they conspired to stop this, uh, yeah, these people. And they basically stopped the caravan of cars uh, that was, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that was stealing the trees, uh, leading to a rebellion. Uh, so when I went there, uh, when I met these people, uh, they, I met the artists from, from the village and they invited me to visit them. Uh, they took me to this forest and basically it's, it's, it's a forest or let's say it's the park of the village. Uh, what they have done was to take the, the burned uh, the burned wagons that resulted from the confrontation, and they placed them in the forest, and so they hang some of the of the wagons. So to me, it was like a very strong experience. It was a very shocking experience, uh, or shocking like in, in a good way. I mean, like uh, it was really. I could feel the, the intensity of, of, of what happened there, or I could really feel, yeah, like, like really I could connect, you know, not just only my imagination to what had happened or what I read about it, but suddenly I, I was in front of, of, yeah, something witnessing. <clears throat> but also it was like a very strange or interesting, or almost like surreal uh, vision to see this burnt wagons or remains of a war like just been hanging in, in, in the middle of this forest and and I think they in a way semantically they connected very well to things like let's say the source of the problem which was the the, the plundering of the forest the, the um, yeah the ex extract the way they extracted let's say the, the prime matter from there uh, together <clears throat> with the wagons or, or, or the actual fight. So, so to me it was really, uh, yeah, it really touched me a lot to, to be there. And visiting them, it really like sparked completely. Uh, yeah, it put me to think, it put me to really uh, try to understand what was for me that, that experience. Uh, yeah, it, it really created a sort of, of admiration of, of the happening, you know? But also put me to reflect a lot about what is the condition of these artists living there. So, what means in a way to be a, an artist from an indigenous uh, group, you know, or etnia? Uh, what means to live as an, uh, to be part of an artist, a very small artist community in a very small town that is not connected, let's say, to the city or to the Mexican art world in, in the regular way. And what I discovered was also like a sort of, um, yeah, like besides the difference of who we are and the different way we live, uh, like a sort of very strong and easy, um, like connection, <clears throat> I will say as artists. So I noticed that we, we will share different interests that in a certain level, there was not really like a, such a big difference between who we are and where we live and, and you know, culturally where we come from. Uh, but actually there was like a lot of space in between to, to speak about uh, that they were not, let's say as artists, not that different as what I am 
or what a city set, city artist will be, you know, like a urbanite. And to me, that was also uh, an important discovery because it was, I realized there, there is a lot of ground to connect. So that really started like a conversation. Uh, I'm collaborating now with a group of younger artists, which are, are yeah, it's a group that started now with the pandemic and they're also trying things and, and to work socially. So for instance, what we're doing now is to invite the Chilean artists to come to Mexico City, almost like a sort of reciprocate exchange, like to bring them here. They arrive next Monday. So it's interesting because it's gonna be almost like the opposite. We need to impress them. We need to <laughs> like show them what we have here. And, and I think it's interesting to me because it also opens up um, different discussions uh, about, you know, that relate to colonialism, that relate to <clears throat> urban versus uh, countryside, you know, uh, mestizos or mixed people as we are versus, for instance, Purépecha people, questions of language, questions of, of coming from different traditions, but also about how traditionally, uh, either from the right wing or the left wing or conservative or progressive people refer to, let's say, this kind of other that lives in the country, which in a way also brings into a mirror relationship of perhaps we are the other or, or how we relate in this way. So there are interesting things, for instance, to me, because for instance, um, one of their wishes is to come and see the galleries in Mexico. You know, they're interested to see the galleries. And we will assume that they coming from a, <clears throat> from a village that became autonomous, that has rebelled, that has this kind of very strong heroic past, and that is from the Purépecha uh, culture, you know, like they will be, completely busy with a different system, or they would be not interested at all in commercial art world circuit galleries. But then you realize that they are perfectly aware that they also have a desire to participate in this world, that they're interested. So it's been, for instance, very interesting to collaborate with, with this group of younger artists, which are quite ideologized, and then suddenly enter into these funny discrepancies of what one is expecting of the other or what they expect, for instance, from the Purepech artist to come here and perform. It's a bit like, like something that often happens to me that I travel to another country and especially it happens a lot in the States and I arrive from Mexico and then the first thing they tell me is that they are gonna take me to a Mexican restaurant. You know, <laughs> It's like the last thing I want to do. <laughs> I prefer to eat hamburgers or whatever. But it, it, it's like this kind of expectation of you are this other and you're, which in a way you are and you cannot deny it, but there is also like all these other forms of connecting to, to, to other people in general. So for me, that was also uh, quite a lot, uh, the exercise of, of, of writing this text to try to find a different uh, stage of where to stand in front of this other person or this other group of artists. So it became a complicated uh, text to write because even often when you have very good intentions about describing someone else, when you are like, uh, for instance, saying like, I'm gonna write about the Swiss artist and even with the best intentions or being critical, but not even trying to, you know, like even in their favor, you know, like trying to write, you often can end up, or is what I noticed by writing, that you can end up sounding patronizing. You can end up sounding um, even with the best intention. So how to write a text where you avoid that, you know, where you can write about the other, but not only in admiration, you can also be critical, but let's say without entering this kind of well-meant or badly meant unconsciously, uh, uh, yeah, descriptions of who there is. Like you state something, you say like, okay, the Purépecha artists are great because their relation with blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and then you realize that, that, you know, you enter very delicate positions. And one of the, the important things is that I went with them for a second time and I uh, told them I was writing a text. 
and that I would like to show them, that I would like, you know, they will be the first readers and after that I will be able to publish another text. So that became really like a challenge because I knew they were my first readers, they were, it was about them. They were happy that I was writing the text because there is not a lot of literature yet about what they're doing. So for them, they felt it contribute to what they do. Uh, but in the, in the other hand, they were my first critics. So it was really like, oh my God, like how do I write? Not to please them, because they also say something very good for me, which was like, you, we might agree with what you write. We think it's good that you write. We, we might agree or not with what you write, but you're free to do it. You know, like it's your opinion. So that was really like a big help. But in the other hand, I have to put myself in this exercise of, how to talk about someone else, how to talk. That is not just your friend or your pal, 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 you know, like it's not just your accomplice, but somebody like you are completely new, uh, meeting you. Uh, so it went through that. <clears throat> then I, I also share with other people, uh, people I consider uh, good critical minds, like for instance, uh, Ingard, who you know as well, Imar Ingard Emelhans, who is a uh, uh, yeah, prominent academic here, quite critical, very much into, into uh, post-colonialist or decolonialist discourse. So, <clears throat> and not with the fact of just having the perfect text and like sanitizing, but just to understand where you are stepping uh, in, let's say, wrong positions. But to me, it was very important to find a way to this to describe the other, let's say, in a more horizontal way. And, I, and the place where I found this was possible was in assuming that we're artists. Uh, anyhow, you know, like from wherever we go or whatever stage in our career is known or known or whatever, we are artists and from that point of, let's say, uh, being colleagues, we can trace a certain, uh, I would say, connection that just there. Uh, so that's the text I, I, I choose. Uh, the text is becoming part of uh, animation. So it's, it's, it's become the narrative voice of, uh, of an animation I'm working with, about, uh, with, or of. <laughs> or, uh, right. <laughs> <An> animation <film. laughs> I'm going to present it next week in Michoacan, in Pascuaro. Um, so it became a whole paradox because in the text, I, I propose the curator that that I will do nothing. You know that for me, it was enough, or it was sufficient, or it was really the point of going to Michoacan in the middle of this pandemic was to understand that you know to see the place, to meet some people, and to admire them, or to the, you know to dedicate my work to them instead of trying to push my work or say like, this is what I do. Uh, and that Guillermo and me will do nothing, you know? But the, what is this nothing? So that became really like a big question in the text. I proposed that Guillermo and me will just go there and hang out and do this kind of Rousseau thing of just wandering and thinking and talking together. But then I, I, I realized that I had to be more radical in a sense. So I decided to rebuild the space and to rebuild the, you know, the forest with the with the cars uh, in 3D. So I did what I normally do, for instance, to to <clears throat> yeah, when I'm planning an exhibition, I, I use these programs and I build a bit my projection of the show and how I'm planning it. Uh, so I build it like that. So basically, we build this mountain, uh, we put trees, we hang burnt cars in it. And then I realized that Guillermo and me are, were more like astronauts. So in a way we were like these complete foreigners, like just arriving there. And so I put two astronauts and it just becomes this kind of oniric or, or strange, really horrible, ugly uh, 3D animation. I also try not to do it, like let's say in my style or, or to, so I just bought these model figures, you know, like that you use for 3 d is very generic. And I'm using the text as, as a narration, you know, as, as, as a overvoice that is just telling you through. 
And the text is a bit repeating, a bit like the news, you know, like, like when you have this breaking news that you see five images and then they just repeat and repeat and repeat. I mean, there are not five images, it's, it's like a seven minute loop, mm -hmm. but it just keeps repeating. So we're gonna put it now. And I think the paradox is that at the end it became a lot of work. So doing nothing means a lot of work. It means a lot of writing work, editing work, and then, you know, like image making work. So actually we work a lot. So this is not so easy to do nothing as you expect normally. Uh, so that's also gonna be shown next week. So I'm also in the preparation of this. So it's two important things for me uh, evolve from this situation, which is uh, the invitation of the Pura Pacha artists to come to Mexico City. They come for a month. Uh, I try to organize a way that they meet as many people as possible and also from different factions. Also, they would go to Galeria Kurimasuto, which is the gallery I work and let's say it's a more commercial venture. Uh, more an artist venture, but they also will go to the uh, University Museum to MUAC uh, to take part of, of a public program and speak. They are staying in the residency of SOMA, which is, is uh, yeah, like a postgraduate initiative that, like artist initiative that happens in Mexico, it's more like a school. And they will also work in a studio from a from it's a place called Obrera Centro that now function with so it's like an independent space so it's, let's say it's like completely at a, a different position so I'm, I'm trying to design a program for them where they will go through all sort of positions you know from the radical uh, left wingers to the bourgeois artist uh, circuit you know so they meet all these different places because I also think it's important to be generous in that sense and not place them in a particular environment and put them into a faction, but ju it's just for them to choose and see. And, you know, I think the, the more they know, and in, I mean, they know about it, but the more they meet these people and, you know, also the, it's a collective, but it's also like made of individual artists. So they all have different things, you know, some are 30 years old and some are like almost 60 years old. So it's also changing. So for instance, the, six, the almost 60 years old people is already established. Uh, this person, I think he has other wishes or other desires. He, he wants a market or he wants to improve his market. And the younger ones, they want to meet people, you know, so they want to, let's say, they're still learning in a different way. So. So I think this is a, an interesting situation for them. Um, and the other is to present the exhibition. In, but I mean, I'm pleased because the, the biennial I was originally invited, they never canceled the, the situation. They are also not doing it online. So they are doing it for real. Uh, but, <clears throat> but yeah, we're gonna have the most sad opening ever possible. <laughs> so it's just like, I think only 10 people will attend the opening. It's like super small. Uh, everybody with a mask, you know, like really, really detached. But still, it's placing an, a piece in an exhibition. So that's also an important gesture these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, in, in your text, you, you hit a lot of um, big questions or crucial questions, like one of the, the ones that stuck most of it was this opposition between the useless artist and the usefulness or the uselessness of an artist and the usefulness of the artisan. And when I was reading it, I was like a, a little bit um, unsure if you are kind of making, um, how would you say, a, a stance or a proposal or fighting for the, the autonomy of art in, in, in a time where everybody's talking about activism and engaged art and engage with the social you also connect that in um, with with the current uh, funding system in mexico where the new president um, since 2018 amlo uh, actually demands for a kind of usefulness of the artists and with his slogan uh, the poor first 
uh, all you bourgeois artists are basically uh, not the poor guys, but the, the rich middle class and upper class. So suddenly a whole um, support system for for contemporary artists falls away or is kind of shifted in the sense on one side to say, OK, you need to do useful art or um, yeah, or kind of you, you use the word like service providers uh, of art and on the other side uh, all of the money or at least that money that's remained is basically invested into the Chapultepec uh, project uh, the park which uh, Gabriel Orozco is supposed to um, design or create and I like how you then use sorry the your uh, artists in in Ceran who basically find a nice middle way maybe you can yeah, I mean, I, this, I mean, is of course related to a very local context. So in, in the discussion, I'm talking very much about what's happening in Mexico, but I guess also touches other places or, or there is like a, a wider way to, to approach it. Uh, I mean, I think the, the question there is, is, is yeah, it's like, which is a very long uh, question that has been ha happening for a long time. Like what's the use usefulness of an artist or if artists should be autonomic in, and in which way, you know, because uh, I mean, it's either you have engaged art or you have, let's say art about art sake, which is kind of just busy with, let's say formal issues. So that's maybe a caricature of how to put it, you know, but I also think has to do not so much with the kind of output that you do as an artist, but also has to do with how you work as an artist or your relationships in, rela in, in, in relation to your work. Like, let's say, do you work for a larger agency? So do you work for the state or do you work for certain, let's say, private companies or for NGOs or, or do you work out of your own sake? How you deal with that? Uh, I mean, I defend a certain autonomy of the artist in the sense of uh, I like to do the projects I want to do in relation to the logic I'm developing. So in my case, what I found was uh, is some kind of like uh, like system where I'm able to work to sell some of my work and then I can reinvest some of my earnings in doing what I want to do socially, for instance. So I'd rather don't let's say, if I, if I have a social need, like let's say if I want to, to work uh, or to do something with the Purepeche artist, I'd rather find the funds myself or I, I'd rather, so, but that's the way I solve it. I don't say that that's, that should be it. But in the moment there starts this uh, demand, let's say coming really from a powerful uh, institution like the state, uh, that art should be in a way or should not be in that way, I start to become a bit this, yeah, um, uh, I say suspicious, I start to question it. Uh, I think I'm trying to figure out in the text, what is this relation? Uh, and also I'm, I'm responding to, to a question because uh, I was very involved, let's say, trying to defend this Fonca and this, because supposedly it was going to disappear. So, and I think it's very beneficial for the artists in general, uh, you know, this system of grants and, and it's a bit like, almost like a, a sort of academy without being called an academy, but it's really like a, a run by artists. So, <clears throat> so maybe you can explain quickly how Fonca works. Is it like, a, if you say it's a grant, you get it for a year or is it for? Yeah, it's a grant, but also, I mean, it's, it, it works in different ways. It's, it's, uh, it's a money from the state to support the arts, uh, and you have different sections. So one is for, um, for younger artists, so up to 35, you can apply. And that's uh, combined, let's say, with some kind of educative system. So it almost performs a bit like postgraduate for, for artists, but you have you have it for a year and you have three reunions with, with let's say, with your generation and with, a, with some mentors. So it has become very important in the formation of many artists, most of the artists in Mexico, 
because I mean it's not a huge money, but it's a money enough to live a month, you know. So you you might not produce a lot, but you can live as an artist. But then you have these three day reunions where you meet, uh, yeah, you meet your group, and then. The interesting thing is that you don't only meet the visual artists, you also meet the musicians, the theater people, uh, writers. So you meet really the cultural community mm -hmm. and your age, <clears throat> and also some of the mentors. So it really creates like a lot of links. So it creates a lot of possibilities for the future, let's say for collaborating. You know, you might find somebody who's writing incredible texts that you connect with and eventually that becomes a collaboration in five years. So it's very good in that sense. Then you have after 35 to, well, you die, you have the national system of creators, which are like larger grants and they are for three years. And those are a bit more, more substantial, but also allow people to live as artists, but also produce. And that's quite interesting. And that's what becomes more like sort of academia. The important thing is that the juries are peer, uh, juries, so it's really like uh, peer to peer. So it's really artist to artist. So it becomes a group of artists selecting the new group of artists. And then once you are selected, you, part, you become part of the system and you also become part of other juries. So it really, really becomes a bit of, a, let's say, self-legitimizing artistic academy. It becomes almost like a guild. And of course, it's from the states, and they are functionaries, but they are more there to regulate and you know to to make it happen. But it, it has this kind of certain autonomy. It's not an uh, it's not absolutely autonomous, but it's autonomous in the sense of that the discussions come from artists, uh, so they also evolve the way art is evolving. So in that sense, it's important. And then you have a third part, which is the emerito. So it's like a grant to, to very accomplished people, mostly like very old, older artists. So, you know, some already are like wealthy and some are not, doesn't matter, but it's people who have really accomplished something in their lives. So it's mostly people over 60, sometimes 70, like the big names, uh, which in a way is what uh, holds the whole thing together, you know, like, it's kind of like the biggest award you can get as an artist. <clears throat> and I mean, it's been functioning very good. And in the last years, I mean, it's always controversial, but what is interesting is that brings artists also from all the country together. So you have like a lot of meetings and also from very different social classes. So it's not just about this elite of rich artists, successful, blah, 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 or, the opposite, but it's really bringing people in connection. So you have this kind of very one-on-one -on -one meetings, you know, like you get to know each other, you get to influence each other. So that's been very good. Uh, but the thing, it, 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 it was a fondo, like a font, like a verse, how do you say it? I don't know the, and it's, it's been changing its status. <clears throat> yeah. So the whole discussion now is that it's becoming, let's say a more formalized, Kind of thing, but there was a lot of suspicion. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Okay. There yeah. were many suspicions, and, and oh. it was very paranoid in the moment uh, because a lot of artists we felt that it was going to be stopped. Hello. Yes. It's fine. It's all, all good. good. You have to uh, move your mouth, then we can hear you. There. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, so, so we form a group of people trying to represent and trying to challenge that and understand what was going on. And I became a bit like the person who was in charge to, to speak with the director. And so I spoke to her and we had a couple of meetings and she posed a very, a very important question, I thought, which was, uh, you know, you have these grants, then you have the pandemic, and suddenly it looks like the, the grants are in danger to disappear. And all the artist community rises and starts to complain and are really angry and makes a big fuss uh, for the money. But she told me like, from the outsider's point of view, let's say outside the art world for the community in general, 
it just looks like the grant the artists are complaining because they're gonna lose their grants. So it just looks like they are, you know, like just busy complaining about their money, about their helps, but it's not visible how artists are becoming engaged in the situation we are living now, which is, as you know, like a like a very extraordinary situation, you know. Uh, so I thought it was like a very fair question. I thought, okay, uh, I understand, you know, it's not always clear from the outside or for other people, what are the dynamics or when we talk about autonomy or when we talk about our freedom or our importance as artists, it's not that clear, you know, it, it makes sense inside of our own discussions. So we need to find a way, or it might be helpful or might be healthy even to find a way to show our engagement. And that created like a very, very big discussion in, in the arts here. Uh, and a very difficult discussion, I would say, you know, because the question was very simple. The question is like, how can artists show to the outside world that they are engaged people? That doesn't mean you have to become an activist necessarily. But that doesn't mean you have to uh, stop making art and suddenly let go. But you have, how can you do that? And it's a simple question, but it's like a really difficult answer. And especially nowadays when most artists stop making art and start to make activism, for the outside, it becomes difficult to understand that because it makes sense inside of the art world, the radicality of becoming an activism. But let's say for the outside, they just become more and more normal or they become less and less an artist or what people from the outside think artists are. You know, like for normal people, artists do paintings or sculptures and it's just more simple. Their image is Dali or their image is the Warhol if you want. And then in the very sophisticated this world of the arts, uh, the discussion suddenly brings artists to look more, let's say like activists or like somebody who's outside of the art world, but in, outside of the art world, that just looks normal. You know, it just looks, they look less artists. Mm -hmm. So it became really like a paradox in that sense or how to make, uh, how to bring solutions to that. And so, yeah, that's also being part of the background of let's say the, the longer discussion into that. Oh. And this kind of connects to this, um, let's call it the enlightenment moment in the, in the forest where, where we have this idea of autonomy, of uselessness. And you, in your text, you quote um, Peter Sloterdijk, a German uh, philosopher. Not quite, I don't know if Irngard totally agrees on him, but uh, yeah. Uh, and over there, you talk about uh, a situation of um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who's here in Switzerland, in the lake of Bienne, floating in, um, in, a, in a rowing boat and basically, how do you say, lying on a boat, sailing aimlessly on Lake Bienne in Switzerland. And maybe as a kind of small, um, how do you say, media change, I'll uh, read what you wrote or the quote. Mm. And maybe we can talk a little bit about this idea of the reverie of the uselessness of um, and how you connect that to to the sculpture park and the autonomy of of the artists um, you were talking about so philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau reflects on this regard lying on a boat mm. sailing aimlessly on Lake Bienne in Switzerland in the fifth walk of his book a reverie of a solitaire um, walker his finding gave rise in the dawn of modernity to romanticism, thus contributing to the formation of the societies in which modern man lives. Sloterdijk writes, on some sunny autumn days, the persecuted author by now settled, da settled down and enchanted by the charm of the quiet island rode out onto the lake. Somewhere far out, he put down the oars and lay down in the boat on his back to indulge in his favorite activity. He surrendered to an inner drifting for which the author used the word reverie. One could also describe this following, this flowing of the soul without clinging to any one topic as an immaterial meditation in the European rather than the Far Eastern sense. Rousseau himself, 
says that at times he let himself drift for hours, immersed in reveries that had no real object, yet were a thousand times sweeter for him than all the things usually known as the pleasures of life. He often approached a point where he was ready to say, I wish this moment would last forever. In this intentionless drifting, he discovered the pure psychological duration in which the conventional course of time with its memories and anticipations disappears, making room for a flowing succession of now moments, jetzt momenten, uncorrupted by any flaws and undisturbed by any thoughts of absent things. The feeling of tranquility expressed in these lines is not alien to our own times because they convey no less than the first appearance of a concept of existence in which the modern individual enters the scene. The individual at once presents itself as a new subject of freedom, probably for the first time. An experience of freedom was expressed in which the subject of freedom refers exclusively to his felt existence beyond all achievements and obligations and also beyond possible ambitions to be recognized by others. The author does not claim to have been close to God or transported to a third heaven. The subject's first words are ones of self-disclosure. He declares that the subject discovered itself in an ecstasy of being with oneself, by sich sein and that it has nothing else to say. By experiencing the feeling of pure existence, it believes it has acquired a sovereign title of being. For Sloterdijk, the existence of individualistic mass society as they exist in this day and age is amazing because they harbor countless individuals with experience in subjectivity, one could almost say with experience in dissolution or asociality experience of happy unusability. I, um, I wanted to read this because uh, also I, I've been quoting Stotterdijk also in uh, one or two texts where he also talks about this uselessness and he talks about, um, how was it, the where the primal scene of the subject, he revealed himself as an exemplary good for nothing, unworldly and unusable, more happy animal than superhuman, more dreamer than character, more emigrant than do-gooder, more holiday maker than entrepreneur. So the first question would be like, um, how, wh why did you think of this text? How did it come to you? Um, and how would you relate uh, let, let's say yourself as an artist, but also the artists you met in Michoacan to this idea of this um, romantic, useless uh, <clears throat> stroller, basically. It came from uh, something uh, from discussing about it with uh, about the text in general and what I was writing about with uh, Enrique. Mm -hmm. And Enrique is my is my assistant, and we have this. Hello, you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's stop hear. here. Hello. We can hear you, but maybe you can't hear us. Okay. Yeah. It came from from uh, while I was writing. I start to speak with uh, Enrique. Enrique is, is my assistant, and we have this kind of ongoing conversation about subjects and things. We. we I always talk and, and discuss stuff. So he referred me to, to the text. And I found the text very interesting in the sense that he's discussing, let's say, two types of, of achieving freedom. So one is like the community freedom. So let's say the uprising and what that means. And basically is, let's say, freeing yourself from a tyranny, which therefore, uh, demands a lot of responsibility. It doesn't make a more freer citizen. It makes it freer from, let's say, a tyrant or from a foreigner, uh, let's say, like from who's banking you, uh, but also demands a lot of responsibility. And that's what happened in Cheran. You know, they, they free themselves from these mafia groups and from 
even from the government, from a corrupt government. <clears throat> but that means that the town has to be very responsible. They have to self-govern, you know, they have to really relate to that. So it's, it's a freedom that is collective, but it's not freeing the individual in that sense. <clears throat> and he compares it to, let's say, the individualistic freedom or the European sense of individualistic freedom. Because in that sense, <clears throat> Sloterdijk is very European. No? It's, that's his point of view. He states it in, in the, in the, very clearly in the text. Uh, but that, that idea of freedom has also influenced the arts, <clears throat> let's say, in Western societies. And in Mexico, we connect also to this kind of influence. So it's really part of it. I personally find it difficult to relate to that. I'm, I'm not an artist who is trying to free myself and be myself and just be an individual. I never work like that. I never really <clears throat> understood it that way. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I like the idea of the autonomy of the artist. I like the idea of, uh, of yeah, working through my own desires and things like that. But let's say I'm not trying to create in my works a reverie or a, this kind of feeling, you know? Uh, but, that, but I thought it was interesting in a way to compare and to find relations to these things. And as you said before, like to find also a middle grounds in relation to it. I also, uh, when I went to Michoacan after being, let's say in the lockdown in my studio and in my house like for so long, uh, one of the strong effects that, that I experienced was to be able to walk in the nature or to go outside, to drive. Also, it, it's really a big place, so I could drive like really long. I could just do this kind of road trip thing and then go to places and walk and, and be in the outside. So I also kind of realized the importance of the outside space. Like suddenly I was thrown into the other side of, of the coin. Let's say I was kind of in the inter interpeti, like in the, in the cold, in the outside. <clears throat> and, and that created a sort of uh, moment of, let's say, self-reflection of, you know, so I was put into writing. I was put not into making more art, but into to a process of, of reflection. So I understood that perhaps, you know, it's, it's important now to, to think about public space in a different way. Uh, to, to use it, you know, to basically, uh, yeah, be able to relate to forests, parks, to nature, to, you know, which is it's not something I'm, I'm, it's not part of my work. I'm very much <laughs> a, a cerebral artist and very much into my own head. And so it's not like I'm an artist who creates things for parks at all, you know, but I suddenly realized that this experience was perhaps interesting and that the use of the public space could also be thought of differently, you know? And there is also this huge discussion now because uh, a lot of money is being put into this Chapultepec Park, <clears throat> which is a huge park in the center of Mexico City. And it's been taken by an artist, you know, by Gabriel Orozco. It's, it's been his proposal to renovate this place. So that also has still a huge discussion, like why an artist is in charge of this, uh, such a big, let's say, uh, public or public project. And also uh, those, do we need uh, a park like that? So I also wanted to, in a way, touch upon this, this discussion um, because I, I think it's, it's important. It's, it's, it's a new space, or at least it's new for me in the sense of, Thinking about it, um, yeah, you know, it has become problematic nowadays to make exhibitions in art galleries or in inside places or in rooms, uh, or even just to be always online. So, <clears throat> so yeah, I, I try to connect in that sense, you know. Yeah. I think at this point, I would like to try and open the discussion. Otherwise, it's just the two white haired men talking to each other. Um, so <laughs> are there about reverie and the discovery of the subject? Are there any questions uh, in the group? Or do we have any questions from Georgiana on the comment side or something?
So we will make the same mistake like the last time, you know, wait for long, wait hours for questions and then um, only come with the questions in the end when we don't have any time. So please. I will, I will try mine. Thank you, Juan. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sorry I came quite late to your introduction. Thank you very much, Carlos. It's very inspiring and uh, very interesting. Um, yeah, I just, um, just going back to the main question you've been addressing uh, along the conversation. And uh, that would be um, this concept of useless um, is uh, from which perspective when you said useless for whom I would open up that question, like from which perspective we define that. And uh, also under which uh, paradigm if we are talking from the Western perspective, and a point in between, or um, yeah, th those are these two questions. And um, yeah, maybe just a, a comment because I'm, well, I'm I'm now also a researcher in curatorial practices, but I have my my practice as an individual uh, independent artist also, um, and there is a a question that comes up all the time um, in relation to also this being in your atelier producing but also producing mostly objects but also um, to looking through the window the rituals of the now the, where people gather what's going on what, how much objects are telling us something in the moments that everything is shaking and we kind of um, need answers or need some directions. So this, um, yeah, I was reading the other day that most of the what's going on in the Western culture deals with this crisis of the individual. And, um, and that pretty much is due to the modernity, how modernity singularizes all, all our experience as and now uh, when we go to museums, or we go to art institutions, we kind of uh, in need of more transubjective and more intersubjective experiences. Uh, perhaps that's why performance and other expressions that try to gather people are succeeding more than the individual objects. Um, so yeah, those are kind of reflections, uh, but these two questions were to start up the conversation. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, Juan. Yeah, I mean, I think in a deep, at the end, I reflect a bit in, more about Mexico in, in this text. <clears throat> and what happened in Mexico is that, I mean, the, <clears throat> let's say the important modernistic art form is muralism. It's like we, it's, that's how art history in a way starts for us. So for, of course you have older, uh, colonial period or the Aztecs, but let's say in modernity is is the the muralism and the muralism had like very clearly a function, uh, educative function. You know, it, it was the idea that uh, in a country where there was a, a huge analphabetism and still people were having to be taught to read and write, uh, images will convey let's say a lot of. Uh, important subject matter to them, like basically about a revolution, about what is the people, what's nationality, etc. So we come from there and I think we have been debating it in the last century, like how you relate to, to yeah, how you relate to, to this demand or to this point of view. Uh, so for instance, you have, you have a group of artists in the 60s, late 50s, 60s, which is called the rupture. So they break with uh, muralism. They, they try to make another kind of art. Uh, so it's been really like this ongoing thing. So we have, let's say, like a long tradition of having to do useful art. So how do you relate to it? Do you want to be part of this or not? I think it's an ongoing discussion. Uh, um, on the other hand, I mean, I think that the, the, this crisis, the today's crisis has, at least for me, it has put like, like also my work in crisis. So for instance, for the first uh, months, I couldn't really work. I, could, I tried, I tried to draw, I tried to make painting, whatever, or a project, 
<clears throat> and it was very difficult to use my studio for that. So what I ended up doing was writing. I was invited to give a lecture. Uh, well, I ended up doing two things. One was uh, I realized that people will be needing face masks and that a lot of people in, in Mexico City will have to anyway work in the streets because we half of the economy is informal. <clears throat> so I associated myself to, uh, to an NGO that works with informal workers. And I created like a little system in my studio with my assistants and the people they know and their families, etc. And also with my gallery and with their collectors to uh, fundraise to produce this face mask. In a moment where also was a huge discussion if they were uh, useful or not, if people would need them. Now, now everybody thinks we should wear them, but at the moment was not, was really in the beginning. <clears throat> so we end up producing this big, uh, yeah, like a large amount of face masks and <clears throat> uh, giving them to people in the streets, especially for street markets and also for cleaning services, like street cleaning services. So it became like a very useful thing, like uh, not only like to give the face masks themselves, but also to think in, in let's say structures, like economical structures, where you can also connect very unlikely people. Let's say the person who is in the street selling groceries or selling fruits to the collector, you know, like with completely people that know, normally they don't meet each other, you know, the, the collectors don't go into the street to buy their, or some do perhaps, but they completely think different. So how to structure that or how to propose also like other ways of creating an economy in a moment where it felt the economy was about to collapse. <clears throat> but in the other hand, uh, because I couldn't go, I had to direct the whole thing from my studio. So I couldn't see it, I couldn't be there. I just had to create the links so the face mask will end up in the street. And because I couldn't see, I asked people to make a picture and send it to me just to have a proof, just to understand what was going on. And the nice thing is that I got 3,000 pictures. So suddenly I got really like 3,000 pictures of people standing in front of their uh, market stand with, with the red mask or cleaning the streets or stuff. And then I realized that these 3,000 pictures were forming an image. They were creating an image of a moment, of a historical moment, an image of the outside. So although I don't know if this is art or it's not art, at the end, an image was created. And I thought this, this is very interesting. And also an image, because they were all wearing this red mask that created, let's say, a literary image. So it created something like, let's say, closer to Edgar Allan Poe, like, the dance of the red mask. So this was like the the mask, the mask, the masked mask uh, in red. So I could also think, okay, the the red masses, the Russian Revolution, or you know, like so it just started to spark ideas in my mind, like uh, motivate, let's say, images. <clears throat> so I thought, well, maybe the action itself is not art, but it creates an artistic moment in the sense that proposes a fantasy or an image that can create literary thought. But at the end, <clears throat> what I ended up doing was writing. <clears throat> and then when I went to Michoacan, again, I ended up, what I ended up doing was writing. So I noticed that I ended up writing for six months instead of making art or, you know, like in, the, in like my drawings and stuff. It has changed. Like in the last months, I also came back and I took what I call the Onkawara strategy, which is to do the same every day, like the most boring way. <laughs> and I just hang to it, you know, like on Kawara was drawing these dates every day. So now I'm, I'm making these collages in my studio, which allow me to, to just pass time, be there and <clears throat> create an object. And now, and now, so what I also noticed is that you might take different positions in different moments, and, and I, but this is really like a, like a wave. So it's really changing. And, you know, like for me, it was very clear uh, when I wrote about being inside, trying to create this image in the outside, that this was a counterpoint, for instance, to the opposite, which was going to the outside to create a personal image. I, I felt, okay, this is really a dichotomy, you know? It's like being inside, being in the, lock, in the lockdown, and then being outside, you know? So that was very clear. But the problem is that the pandemic just goes on. So now I'm in this third period, which is like, okay, the Onkawara moment, like just produce, be bored, you know, like, 
But I also don't know how, if, if there is gonna be a fourth period or a fifth period or, or maybe not, maybe you just get sick and die. So it's really this kind of very strange moment. So I think it's very hard to make conclusions in that sense, to say like art should be this or should be that. I mean, you can ideally think about it, but also in my experience, two months later, you are already challenging that situation. So for instance, in the text that I gave you, I, I let's say, advocate for public space, for the use of parks, for the use of forests, for, hey, come on, let's be artists and, and work outside. <clears throat> but maybe perhaps in, in, in two months, that doesn't make sense anymore. So I think that that way is like a very slippery moment. So I think it's interesting to think about it in, in that sense, because we, we I sometimes think about, about it a bit like a, in an analogy of how internet start to appear in society. And for instance, in the nineties, internet was like the new thing. And there was like a lot of utopia about it. And a lot of artists started to make works online and like really think as a of internet as a free space as a you know there are a lot of examples from that period <clears throat> which when you think about them today they they are they're so naive you know they are so utopian so completely you know like different from what it became and i feel it's a bit the same here like when the pandemic started we start to think like okay maybe we can live the art world in a different way <clears throat> maybe we don't need institutions anymore Maybe art should be blah, 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 blah. But then six months later, we're completely in a different shock or, or but I think it's interesting. I, I'm not complaining. I, I'm not saying this is wrong or anything, but it's just like really like a motor of, of thought in, in, in a sense. Thank you very much. Um, we are again at this point where I have to use my authority as course leader to say that the time's up, but maybe we can have one last question because we've been breaking the rule uh, constantly. Uh, is there somebody around with a quick question that can result in a quick answer as usual? Quick question. <laughs> <laughs> Colette looks like she would like to say something. I don't know, there are a few things I was thinking when I was reading this text. I really enjoyed it. And um, one thing that I was thinking was, do you think we need to like, ex is there a kind of collective need to expand the parameters of what utility means? Kind of encompass more? I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> uh, collective need, yeah, I guess so. It, I think it depends very much what's the definition of art and how you define it as inside the art world or let's say as a member or as a part of it either as a curator, as an artist, as a museum director, whatever, all the roles that are there. And, but how it's also seen from the outside, like what's expected, what's expected from an artist. Uh, and I think there is a discrepancy there. There is like almost like a non-communication. So what we think should be useful inside the art world to the outside world, it might differ very strongly from what let's say outsiders would like to have from the art world, you know, like, so it's almost like the paradox of painting. <clears throat> oh, I got- we can, we can hear you. Ah, okay. We can hear you, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think it depends on that a lot. Like, you know, like when I take the taxi or when I used to take the taxi because I don't take it anymore. But somebody asked me like the taxi driver, like, so what do you do, mister? And I'm like, I'm an artist. So they imagine like a painting, you know, like they see this colorful thing, either abstract or realistic. And so you have like, how do you explain somebody what you do when it has become complex and sophisticated? And also when, let's say, if my project is to become a taxi driver, and that's, let's say, in the art world, like, wow, how radical, this is amazing. He's discussing Uber, and Uber is such a neoliberal, blah, blah, blah. And it comes this whole discussion, and you even get the show where you show the documentation in where, while you were at Uber driver. But how can you explain that to a real Uber driver and say, like, you're an artist, when for him, that his reality is another one? 
So that's, I think, it's a problem of realism and representation. Like, the more realistic we become, supposedly, the less artistic we become, but still we're representing something. The, so there is a kind of drop or disconnection. But I, I think has to, I mean, it's something I'm thinking a lot about, like what's the, yeah, like this, how this new take in realism is sometimes missing illusion and, re, and reality, you know, like so how sometimes we make sense in our own world, in the art world, but actually outside we stop making sense because we are approaching so much reality that we lose our standpoint or something. So I'm, I mean, I'm not trying to be definite about it, but I, I keep thinking about that. So I think that depends very much either if you are inside the art world or outside of the art world, this notion of, of uh, usefulness. There is a question that is posted on the um, uh, live stream and uh, now is my time to use uh, a little bit the idea of breaking the rules, which relates a lot, Carlos, to what you uh, just said. And uh, Linda asks us, um, or you, what, um, how you view the art world today and where do you draw the limits of where it starts and ends? this world as an interdisciplinary artist how do you relate to this world and is it liquid or solid <laughs> i mean my my when i began as an artist what i was very interested was to try to make art outside of the art world so that's how i entered not the, the wrestling world so i created this fictional persona as a wrestler that i wanted to happen or appear outside but that create, creates this paradox you know where it's, it's almost like thinking of the ready-made you know like the ready-made is bringing like a, a normal useful object into the art world and declaring it art so because enters the context of the art world it just becomes part of the discourse of the art world but can you do the opposite what happened when you bring let's say an artistic idea or an artistic piece outside can it still be considered? Or can it form part of culture, you know, like slowly, like let's say how Andy Warhol eventually becomes part of a rec influence a record cover and then influence the, the room of a teenager, you know, like so it really becomes part of, of a larger culture. But can you operate that, let's say, physically or like, like a as a living artist? Can you create that? Is that possible? So it's been a question all the time because I think the moment you cross the boundary you enter into this other field and suddenly what I said to Colette like things make sense or make no sense anymore uh, but of course I'm talking this was 20 years ago so it has also changed a lot so also with internet has changed uh, let's say the access to art through as information also becomes different uh, you know, like you don't longer need to go to an art museum to see art, you can see it online, you can see it in different ways. So I think also this has changed. Uh, so in, perhaps the art world has expanded in that sense. So the limits are maybe more blurred. Uh, also, it has become a question not only for me, but for many artists, like how we deal with reality, how we deal with the outside world. So it also, you know, becomes, becomes a... But yeah, I... I wouldn't know. I mean, I wouldn't know if I think it's liquid in the sense of it's changing. <laughs> you know, it's like it's not a castle anymore. It's not this kind of, uh, let's say, yeah, exclusive space that used to be where just the great masters could be. You know, it's, it's, it's big, that castle is being uh, de defied. Uh, like Arso is not anymore just a Euro, Eurocentric castle or, or a American European castle. You know, it has, has been invaded by, by artists from other places of the world. Uh, so yeah, it's expanding, it's changing. And, uh, but I think the interesting thing now is that, let's say since we cannot travel so easily, since a lot has been canceled, postponed, put in doubt, we also start to refer more and more to our own local art world. But that doesn't mean 
we are going back to how it used to be before, but maybe in a different way, you know, maybe it's changing, maybe now, you know, like it, the, let's say local discussions also become very important. It's not just this international discussion. So in that sense, yeah, again, I think it's liquid, it's changing, you know, so I don't know if I can answer <laughs> such a deep question. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Carlos, for, your, for uh, talking with us about uh, your text and the uselessness, um, the happy uselessness of the artist. In German, it's actually, uh, how do you say, an exclusive or a, uh, it's not a happy, it's just like a kind of extinguished uselessness of the art. Uh, thanks, thanks to the traditions, we can make nicer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit more kind of this kind of useless. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much. A small uh, hint to our um, Romanian institutions. Carlos would love to travel to Transylvania someday and do a project over there. He's been talking about this for like 10 years now and every time he comes to Europe, he says Transylvania. So hopefully we'll be able to travel soon. <laughs> Take care. Okay. Thank, thank you very you. much. Yes, thank hope you. to see you soon here in Romania. Thank you. Thank you. So we will be back in 10 minutes? Yes. 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 Okay.
Hello. 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 Hey. Hello, Adrian. Hi, Bo. Nice that you are joining us. Nice to see you. Yes. Yes. Finally, kind kind of life. Huh? Yes. <laughs> Hello. Welcome. Hello. So I'll do a small introduction. Um, mm -hmm. uh, will you have like a, a PowerPoint that you will share yes. with us? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what do my uh, bosses say? Shall we start? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good. So welcome back to our uh, fourth and last session of today of the opening of the new now autumn school of curating initiated by the art encounters foundation the Cluj cultural center and the european contemporary center of art uh, we have now the privilege and the great um, joy to have zengbo with us who will talk about his work the title of his presentation is dao is in the wheat and as I did before, I'll first read uh, the short biography of Mo and then try and add some personal notes and then I'll hand over the hand over the word, give the word to um, to Bo. Sing Bo lives and works in Lantau Island, Hong Kong, committed to multi-species vibrancy. Zeng investigates the past and images the future from the perspectives of marginalized communities and marginalized plants. He creates weedy gardens, living slogans, and eco-queer films to cultivate ecological wisdom beyond the anthropo-extinction event. He projects, his projects are included in Liverpool Biennial 2021, Yokohama Triennial 2020, Manifesto 12, the 11th Taipei Biennial, the 11th Shanghai Biennial, and the performance program of the 58th Venice Biennial in 2019. I first got to know uh, Zengbo's work uh, at the Manifesta Biennial in, in Palermo in 2019. Over there he had, um, I think, two or three videos within a small bambus garden um, installed, and I was immediately, um, how would you say, affected by it. <laughs> uh, it was a, one of his uh, works which go under, I guess, the name Pterodophilia, or more simply, uh, loving the plants or having sex with plants. And I could connect very closely because some years ago, we also tried to have not sex with plants, but with architecture. So in that sense, this kind of um, transhuman uh, sexual experience was uh, triggered again in me by seeing the work. Um, so I'm very happy that uh, Zeng Bo is joining us today. Um, since then, I've been a great fan of his work. And one might say that this sex plant pterophilia um, part is just one of more or less like six areas that Sengbo is working in. There's a, he does in the, in this part, he also does like workshops for a sex, a plant with sex. There's also um, a kind of work field which one could um, title with uh, slogans where he uses plants and plantations to promote or to use political um, slogans. Then there's also a field uh, where Basically, the question is about how do we get plants into the museums? How do maybe plants conceive art in museums and how can plants be part of museums? There's, a, I guess, one of the bigger areas of his um, research and work is plants in urban contexts. And I guess today we will hear, because it's about weeds, a little bit about that. And then also, as a kind of uh, sixth field, one could say, plants, the role of plants and weeds and other um, yeah, plants, flowers and so on in, uh, in politics and uh, religion. At the moment, uh, Zengbo is in Berlin in a residency initiated by the Gropius Bau 
and over there he is in close collaboration and uh, dialogue with with scientists and biologists from the field. So this is my humble introduction to uh, your presentation, Bo, and I invite you to talk. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. It's really, um, I'm actually humbled by, the, by your um, introduction. So I will go through uh, a few works and um, I'll save time. Usually I think discussion is very productive. So I'll save time for discussion. Okay. I will share the screen. So the COVID-19 pandemic has achieved what countless humans have failed to, uh, countless activists have failed to do over the past 50 years since Earth Day was first celebrated on April 22, 1970. Factories were shut, flights were canceled, people stayed home, tended gardens, and went hiking when possible. Many of us came to the same conclusion. It is okay for us humans to do less. So I'm showing images of a work from two years ago in Thailand. So this is an installation in a national park. Um, so I'll start again, it says, Life is hard. Why do we make it so easy? So when I made this two years ago, um, you know, I was thinking about the ecological crisis, but I think the work actually didn't resonate uh, with a lot of people. It is only actually when the pandemic hit um, that you know people started to notice that I, these images and then the 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 slogan, and um, I think it's quite um, particularly um, poignant in this year. The slogan came from a TED talk um, in Thailand. The original TED talk was, life is easy, why do we make it so hard? It's an activist farmer who was talking about the farming life in Thailand. You know, people could stay as farmers, have a good, relatively easy life. Uh, so why do people choose to go to cities and become migrant workers? So that's the original statement. Life is easy. Why do we make it so hard? And I flip the sentence. Um, you know, I'm not. I'm not really saying no to the original speaker. I'm mainly to point out there's another dimension of life, which is more than human life, um, because the original statement was more about human life in mean, human society. So I wanted to flip it to um, think about life uh, in the more than human sense. So we have made our lives very easy over the last 200 years. And of course, you know, this year it's harder for us, but it's really mainly caused by this backlash. Uh, I see it more like an ecological rebalancing. So among the less 
lessons that the virus has taught us is that we cannot keep living in a city that we own this planet. We do not. We account for only 0.01% of the total biomass on Earth. We have to collaborate with other species, whether we like it or not. This includes addressing the climate crisis and the global ecological meltdown. This also requires us to find a new definition for art. So this is a work I did in Hong Kong. Again, it's a slogan using living plants. So you are the 0.01% refers to our percentage as the total biomass on earth. Um, um, but I'm also linking it to the, um, the we are the 99% slogan uh, made popular by the Occupy Wall Street movement. So I wanted to point out the connection between human inequality, inequality within human society and the inequality in the biosphere. So of course, many of us belong to the 90, many of us belong to the 99% in the human realm. But if we, if we, if we step, um, take a step back and look at the biosphere, then we are part of the 0.01%. So how do we think about these inequalities and how do we address both of these inequalities? Okay. So I started working with plants um, eight years ago um, when people asked me how I, how I decided to migrate from socially engaged practice to ecological practice. I, my honest answer is I actually didn't decide it because I was actually attracted by this patch of weeds in Shanghai. So it was not really my decision, I was tempted. So this is a patch of weeds in central Shanghai. If you go to Shanghai now, this is now the, mo you know, the, the central art area called the West Bank. Many museums are now here. Um, I'm sure if you go to Shanghai, you, you, you will go to this area. But the, when I went there in the summer of 2013, I saw this patch of weeds in the middle of the city. They were just so lush and vibrant. And I was shocked to find this habitat in the center of the city and talked to the curator and said whether I could claim this as part of my art projects in order to keep the habitat for at least a few years. So we went in and identified the weeds in this, in, in this patch, of, um, in this uh, piece of land. And then we also created an online course with local scholars to discuss the relationship between plants and urban history, literature in Shanghai, as well as Chinese medicine, architecture, you know, urban design, etc. So I was interested in the online, um, the MOOC movement. I was thinking, how can we make this um, not not a global situation, but actually related to a local situation? But I very much appreciated the collaborative work. Um, in the MOOC uh, where we can share, we can share something online and many people can access for free. So I, these are friends and who, who also teach in Shanghai in dis different disciplines. So we had an online course and then every Sunday we will have uh, on-site um, activities. So people can watch the lecture online and then come to the site. So this is how I actually started to work with plants. I was more, interested in urban situations at the time, and but I gradually moved to uh, thinking about plants in their own terms. I'll talk about this a bit later. Okay. So since I started working with plants, I this issue whether I'm, I should take the credit of, for the projects I do, of course not because things change after, you know, if I'm working with living beings in particular, things grow and change. And so I only can take half of the credit at most. Okay. So this is another work in Shanghai. Uh, this is another work in China. Um, the, it's a contemporary art museum built in Nanjing. The triangle is uh, a work I did with a local landscape team. We transplanted weeds from surrounding areas to the roof of this museum. Um, I won't go into the detail, but just to say one thing, I knew that the work will change, but I didn't fully anticipate how the work will change. After a few, I, I don't have a picture here, but after a few years after I went back, 
of course, the weeds started to move around, right? They don't stay in, in the, the shape, you know, sort of this um, abstract art shape, they move. And then after a few years, the shape really is now more corresponding to the light and shadow of the building. So when there's light, the weeds grow very well. Um, when there's shadow, they don't grow so well. So the, the original sort of uh, abstract art is now moving more into an ecological situation where they really respond to the light and shadow. So I often talk about this work where I couldn't, I mean, I, I, I could have known if I had more ecological sense, but I certainly didn't know when I started the work and I was happy to see how the work has changed, uh, not by my own intention. So this is another work in another museum in China, uh, working with local farmers to bring weeds to the museum to set up a little garden. Okay. So this is a work about socialism good. Um, so this is a, a slogan when I, I grew up in the 70s and 80s in China. So when I grew up, this slogan was still very much in our life, socialism good. Um, but of course, when we were thinking about socialism, what we were not thinking about um, more than human socialism. So I replanted this and left the plants to decide what to do. And after two weeks, weeds started to pop up. So you can see weeds um, in the patch. Um, so it's, I think in a way it kind of reminds us um, if we, we if we let plants to decide the destiny of this slogan, uh, how, how do they, you know, what, what political idealism they might um, choose. I'm actually returning to this now in my dialogues with uh, scientists in Berlin, um, but I'm more in uh, sort of the, the uh, biological, uh, based on more bio, on biological research. This work, when I did it um, four years ago in 2016, is still more on the visual level. Okay. So I started to, um, I also started to work with uh, ferns in Taiwan. This is in 2016 again. I was in Taiwan and a botanist took me to a forest on the edge of the, uh, the capital city, Taipei, where scientists like him gather ferns. Um, since then, I have been going to this forest every year, except this year because I couldn't, uh, I'm not allowed to, 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 to enter Taiwan because of the pandemic. So since 2016, I've been going there every year to make one short eco-sexual film. I look forward to this annual ritual because the air in the forest is so invigorating. You know, as artists, we usually wake up late, but in order to make this film, we have to get there very early in the morning to catch the sunlight. And, you know, we go there half awake, but because the, the forest is full of oxygen and um, uh, phytoncides, our bodies and minds, really reach a heightened level of agility and attentiveness in the forest. Plants reveal to us the full potential of the three-dimensional space. So mainly in this picture, you can see how densely three-dimensional the forest is. Massive bird's nest ferns perch on trees, uh, tiny moss blanket rocks, the light is dramatic, the sound rich, and the aroma intense. The assemblage has a distinct style, yet it's constantly changing. This forest is better than any artwork I have ever made and better than any exhibition that I have seen. This series of ecosexual films, Tridophilia, uh, it means uh, the in, in love of ferns, portray intimate encounters between local ferns and local men. I really do not know how I came up with this idea. I remember it was difficult to explain it to others until the first episode, this is the first episode, was made. So it's an introduction and then part two shows um, this guy having sex with a giant bird's nest fur and then he starts eating it. Um, 
you know, we, th there's eating in it because this is an edible plant. If you go to Taiwan, make sure you actually try this plant in the restaurant because it's very delicious. So you can always ask for a bird's nest corn, you can eat it like him. Okay, I mean, it's up to you whether you wanna have sex with a plant before you eat it. So part three was with um, three SM performers and I wanted to expand my understanding of sexuality and also to think about the potential of working with plants in sexual performance. So these are people who actually enjoy SM sex and they work with me to really think about how to really play with uh, plants so they can, they, we also talk about the pleasure from the plants perspective, what's possible for them and what's possible for us. And last part was shot last year and uh, mainly about the young leaves, the fronds, um, because as humans, we have been fascinated by these patterns. You, you probably know the violins are designed uh, um, by the, inspired by this pattern. Um, but of course there are many sort of almost alien-like uh, shapes um, that if you look into. So it's two young performers working with young leaves of um, the ferns. So this is an ongoing project. I haven't finished it. So, um, I, I'm, I actually need to, I mean, I, I should have made one this year, but I'll try to do it early next year. Okay. So this series of eco-sexual films portray intimate encounters between local plants and local men. And then last year, I, spun, I, I saw this YouTube video filmed in New South Wales, Australia by ecologist Colin Bauer showing a wasp, um, the wasp there, um, in the common name is orchid dupe wasp. This wasp was passionately having sex with the orchid. You can see this on YouTube because of the internet, you know, I'm not screening. You can easily find this on YouTube. So it's, again, it's animal species having sex with a plant species. So when I saw this, when I, when I saw this on YouTube, I thought, oh, wow, this is just like my film. Or maybe more accurately, my film is just like this in nature. So in both instances, an animal and a plant are entangled in interspecies sexual performance. The most imaginative idea of my artistic career has been proven to be nothing original. So I'm basically copying this. I was simply following orchids and wasps. We stand not on shoulders of giants, but in billions of years of evolution. So since then, I have incorporated this into the exhibition in um, Yokohama, where you can see one side is um, the, my film and the other side is the, the, the scientific footage. Um, this is called pseudo copulation for people who are interested. So two, um, two films are screened in the same space. And then there's a, there's a small print on the wall, maybe you can see. So this is a print by um, uh, Japanese artist Hokusai. Uh, in the in the early 19th century showing two octopuses having sex with a woman. So many people may have seen this uh, print in, in art history books. Uh, I simply incorporate this in, in the exhibition to point out, you know, earlier artists already thought about interspecies sex. Of course, they were using print. There's no film media at the time. So I was happy to kind of folding these different threads into the into the exhibition to point out, you know, what I'm doing is actually not that original. So this is a workshop I did last year in Venice as a part, uh, part of the public program, inviting people to try it. Um, um, so we have plants uh, with the audience, half plants, half audience in the in the theater. So I'll just briefly talk about uh, another project I did last year. This is not on my website yet. So I was invited to, um, to do a residency in Japan in Kyoto. And um, so I was taken to different areas in Kyoto. Um, and then one particular area made, what, uh, made um, me realize something. And then I decided to work in this neighborhood. So this, is a, this, is, this area is called uh, Sujin in Kyoto. And it's, um, I'll, I'll show you some historical information and then um, talk about it. So this is an area where it's kind of like, um, 
the untouchables in the Indian caste system. In Japanese, it's called black min. So it's people who, who are considered um, filthy in society. So these are people who use, who work with animals like butchers or people who work with plants like gardeners. So they work with other species and then, then they were considered filthy and then they were cast on the edge of the society and being sh uh, shuffled around. So this particular neighborhood in Kyoto is called Sujin. And if you go there, you, if you walk from the Kyoto train station to this neighborhood, first you pass through very crowded areas. As soon as you step into the neighborhood, it, all of a sudden it becomes quiet, right? Because people don't want to go there still. So the stigma is still very much uh, present in, in, in today's society in Japan. So I'm showing this historical photograph where um, the neighborhood people got together to build a primary school and you know they have to do their own education, set up their own schools, and they tend to help, you know, they becomes sort of a co uh, cooperative community. So these are countless people who have graduated from the primary school over the years. And uh, they also introduced farming and physical education into the primary school. Um, and then in 19, in 1922, a very important manifesto was um, started in this neighborhood. So this is a manifesto to call for human equality, kind of like the, um, um, the, the rights bill in the United States. So they were saying as, as a society, we really need to think about all the humans as equals. So this is a historical movement. It's known by every Japanese student in high school. Um, and then there was public housing and it was run down and I show you. So it's also interesting, the neighborhood is right next to the Kamo River, a major, the main river in the city that flows through the city. With river, of course, there are always birds around. And also there's giant salamander in the mountain area of the if the ecological condition is right, the giant salamander actually swims down the river. So, um, and now because the population is going down, like this is, I'm showing contemporary photographs, the, the human population has gone down from 10,000 to 1,000. Um, and then weeds started to grow and the city wants to revitalize this area. And so these things really made me think about how do we how, you know, how, how do we think about this history of this area and also the future of this area? This is the, the document I talk about uh, calling for human equality. So I started a workshop. I, I started, I organized a workshop um, with local young artists and also a local community organizer. So we spent three days trying different physical exercises. We learn from each other because everybody know something that the other people don't know. So each person teach the, the rest something. And then we also go hiking. We look at different animals and plants. So after three days, we updated the manifesto. So we created two new manifestos to think about the ecological equality in this area in the future, right? So how do we see the human population decline, not as a negative, situation, but actually as an opportunity to think about um, multi-species relations. How do we work with a river? How do we work with a tradition of people working with uh, animals and plants? So this is a small gesture to, to bring in these ideas into the neighborhood, which still carries the stigma, like I said earlier. The reason I work with local young artists was because I knew I would, you know, I, I would leave after a year um, and I really, it's really there. I really need to to convince them to do something. So because they live there, they actually work there. So th what they can do re can really affect the neighborhood in the long run. Okay. So these are the two manifestos we created last year. So this year, because the pandemic, I was uh, finally spending most of my time in Hong Kong until I came to Berlin. Um, so I started to go up the hill where I live to make a drawing every day um, because the previous few years I've been traveling to work in different uh, cities and countries. 
And finally, I'm home and where I can spend time in, with the plants around me to make, um, to make myself more familiar. So every day I go up the hill to, to do a drawing. And since I came to Berlin, I also have been drawing every day one, um, one plant uh, around me. Well, I mean, one or well, a few plants around me. So these are the drawings from Hong Kong. For me, it's really not about, I mean, for me, it's really not about drawing these drawings as objects. It's really more about sp spending time with plants because if I, if I, you know, I, I started taking pictures, but then I realized, you know, taking pictures is just, you know, um, a few milliseconds. If I spend time there to draw, at least I spend an hour with the plants. And since I came to Berlin, I've been talking to scientists um, um, to learn from their research and really ask them to help me to think about how plants practice politics. The projects I worked on uh, since 2013 until this year have been mainly thinking about how plants are entangled in human history, in, in our political um, history, in our colonial history, et cetera. Um, I've, now I'm thinking about how plants actually practice politics on their own. So how do, I, how do we imagine or perceive their political practice. Not so much in so much entangled in human situations, but in their own um, in, in their own ways. Uh, I can talk about this uh, if if, um, if if we if there are questions. I, I can get into more detail on this. Okay. So I just uh, I'll just say a little bit, and then uh, we can we can have a discussion. So I mentioned that the work I did in Taiwan was a copy of um, nature, but being outrun by flowers and wasps does not mean that we should just give up and do nothing. I learned recently from reading philosophers Roger Ames and David Hall that the Taoist term Wei, I'm reading Taoist text um, this year, Dao Jing in particular, the term Wei should not be translated as no action or non-action, but non-coercive action that is in accordance with the principles of all things. Conservation scientists have also shown that human participation when practiced wisely can actually contribute to biodiversity. A 2019 study concludes that areas managed by indigenous communities in Australia, Brazil, and Canada have similar levels of vertebrate biodiversity to that of nature reserves. And I'm sure many people know uh, Native Americans when they managed the forests um, historically, they were actually able to contribute to biodiversity of the forests that they live in. So it really depends on whether we work with other beings in the planetary garden or exploit them until we all drop dead. It is time that we define art, not as human only creation, but the vibrancy of 10,000 things. So 10,000 things is a Taoist term, um, Wu. it's a literal translation, but people can also translate it as myriad beings. So I'll stop here. I mean, I have more works, of course, um, but we can probably get into discussion and if something comes up and then I'll share more images. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Bo, for mm -hmm. this quick um, insight into your work. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll ask first into the round if there are any questions before I ask a question. I have a question. Um, I was wondering if you can give us more insights on the practices, or well, I, I believe we've developed like a set of practices through which one prepares themselves for these uh, uh, plant encounters, like how we make space for this. Mm. So I, 
I'll try to. I mean, I'll try to respond. I mean, if it's not if it's not clear, just uh, I mean, you know, just let me know. I I actually have been pretty reactive, so I I you know I often I get invited to do a residency. That's that has been the mode of practice for the last few years, at least you know in Shanghai, in Taiwan, in Kyoto, now in Berlin. So I I I, I get to the place I. I walk around. I, um, of course, I also talk to people. I, I read whatever I can find, but I mainly just walk around. Even now, when I talk to people, let's say if I want to talk to a scientist in Berlin, I usually ask them to go on a walk with me. So we don't sit down. I mean, like you know, now we're sitting down. You know, I'm sitting on my floor. Actually, this is more comfortable for me. But usually, I like walking as we talk. So you know, if 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 I have better internet, maybe you know, there's better lighting. I'll just go outside and do this um, because I, I want to I want to get to know the city I want to be able to um, talk to someone not as a sort of abstract human being but more like a, a, a sort of a homo sapiens embedded at least in urban ecology and then things I something something happens in my mind. And then I, I try to pull people also into my projects. I try to see what plants are around um, uh, the, the geological situation. And then something I now talk about how projects grow, right? So I don't say, you know, it's something is created. Projects actually grow. It's really like, you know, I, of course I bring something here and, but it's also very much depend on the condition of the, um, the, the, the place um, where I, I happen to be in. So these sort of the, the in Chinese, we say the 天时地理人和, right? So the, the time of the heaven, the advantage of the land, and then the harmony of the people. So, um, so these situations, um, I respond to it. And I something will grow. And I think now when you know I also teach, um, so I often I often say to students that you just you 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 have to trust something will grow because we live on earth and something will grow if we if we if we just water things, if we just you know nourish things, something will grow. And we have to let things grow rather than we try to, you know, I was talking to my partner, you know, I did something in Paris, um, a residency in Paris and that didn't work very well. And then now I realized the main reason was I try to control it. I try to shape everything before I go. So now if I, um, I, I learn to respond and to, to the situation. And then I also, I often say this, you know, just another point, I often say my, projects are quite messy. So you see, you know, I do drawing, I do workshop, I do film, I, you know, sometimes it's a slogan, it's an installation. So first I thought it's, you know, I felt very uncomfortable because, you know, many artists are much more consistent. They have, they have um, um, sort of a good series of works. And I tend to have these different projects entangled and then they happen uh, at the same time. And then after a few years, I realized, you know, um, Maybe this is more ecological, right? So this, you know, I'm, it's, it's really like I'm cultivating a garden. There are these different projects, and sometimes I water something. This this project grows a little bit this year. This project grows a little bit next year when different conditions are um, are uh, are right. So it's really this messy, but it's 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 more lively, perhaps as a long term practice. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Otherwise, I would have uh, uh, Juan, please, and, um, then, and yeah. then Julia. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Bo. It's very inspiring and uh, really beautiful, reconciling, especially in these moments when we detach from any outside to see your work. But um, yeah, I'm very intrigued about um, the performances uh, with nature, with, where these um, bodies are interacting with other bodies, natural bodies, in something that um, you call sex. And um, I'm, I'm still, Yana, I would like, maybe you can elaborate a bit more um, because I kind of um, understand the word 
sex in the context you are placing it as a, more from the Western perspective as an Anthropocene perspective. And I would like to explain that um, because I see the bodies of the humans are kind of having um, self stimulation with the plants, but I don't see, and maybe something that you, you are uh, speculating and researching about what is the response of the plants and if there is kind of a stimuli that they during this, because it's not clear an intercourse that we attribute like the word sex in the Western perspective, let's say to, it's, it's an stimuli and an exchange of, um, um, yeah, somatic aspects between these two entities, uh, human and, and no human. And also the word desire, which is always very much linked to the human, how, how you see that from the perspective of the plants. And that's one question. And the other question would be related to, um, are you including other epistemologies like from Asia, for instance, how you relate with um, knowledge through plants or how plants, for instance, in food, uh, the, through a stimulation, you can also, um, through um, eating the plants, you can also kind of embody other stages of desire. So <clears throat> that to me is also a way of sex, let's say. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. No. Um, I haven't done any research on how the plants res uh, how the plants uh, respond. Or, I mean, I, I know how the plants respond. I don't know how they feel. Um, I think it's for me. It, I think, and you know, for me, I'm. This is kind of excuse, but it's also um, um, sort of answering you in a very honest way. I think it would take millions of years for co-evolution to really play out. So I think it's too short of a time to really see how plants will respond. So this is my, this is my, um, this is my thinking that usually it's something we, we start, you know, one species will initiate something and then the other species will respond. And then there will be a co-evolution going on, right? So, you know, I started to do this uh, four years ago and it's only, you know, as our, as our project, I'm thinking maybe the last part will be more like a movement where I invite people to join. So it becomes more like a practice. But unless we, as humans, we start to uh, really change the way we live, to change the way we practice with other species, then there's not really a strong um, co-evolutionary force. So it becomes one-time performance, like you said, right? So in this one-time performance, it, it's very much, of course, it's very much part of our way of thinking about things. We, we think about these things through these performative ways, but it's not really on the phenomenological level. So I think if anything on the phenomenological level will require millions of years of, I mean, millions of, or I mean, maybe if we do it faster, it will be thousands of years of co-evolution. So that's one thing. But I do, I, I do think where you are suggesting is something very important. I mean, that's actually, that's, actually, you know, it's, it, it, it's in my mind and I've been trying to move myself, but also trying to move in my practice where we, so it, it's no longer just, thinking, talking, discoursing, using language, but really thinking about how our bodies change. Right? Um, so it's not only to think about how the plants will respond, but also how by doing these practices, I mean, if I see the film as a practice, but I'm also doing other practices. By doing these practices, how our bodies will change gradually, um, if not genetically. Okay? But of course, this goes into more by our uh, area which I, which I'm not um, really that active, uh, you know, which I haven't haven't been actively engaging in, and then the I think my intention in making the film is not really so much in the bio art sense. Okay, 
so I, of course, these projects are still very much um, about gestures or perform performative gestures to, to raise these questions that we need to start dealing with. But I, I completely acknowledge your question. I have, you know, there's, it, this is, you know, I keep saying no matter how many years I can work on this until I die, I'll be only scratching the surface. Because whatever we really want to change, it really takes generations of evolution, et cetera, to change our bodies and genes. Um, so I don't think my art practice will ever get to that point. Okay. But I do think it's, you know, as artists, we can start to raise these and that we can we can talk and debate about this. But I mean, I, I, I can also say, I mean, maybe this will sound very pessimistic. I also, I mean, you talk about, you, you, you talk about desire, right? You talk about um, um, pleasure. I think it's very much in our desire still um, to get closer to other beings because we are so detached from other forms of life. Um, so this sort of biophilia, biophilic desire, I think it, it has to be one of the strongest desires that we have right now. Um, I'm not sure whether other beings, other plant, you know, like plants, they really desire our company. So of course you can say, okay, in that sense, the film is also um, still has the anthropocentric um, flavor, uh, which I fully acknowledge. Yes, that's why I, I mean I mentioned you know this year I'm talking to scientists to think about how plants actually practice politics in their own term. Yes. If I may jump in and connect mm -hmm. uh, this answer to a question that has appeared on our live stream. Um, someone in the public asks uh, the question of trust. So you mentioned about desire and if the desire from our side, but also if the plants desire us. But um, the question from uh, our viewer is, is it somehow a form of trust in the regenerating power of nature? Mm, I, I'm actually really fascinated. I mean, I, I'm, I'm saying something else just to take a step. So I'm really fascinated by every time I show this work, I mean, I'm showing images, not the actual work itself. Every time I show this work, these ethical questions arise. So, um, you know, after a little while, I always say, you know, as humans, whenever we think about sex, we think about ethics. And it's almost like, it's only when we, when we start to think about sex, we start to think about ethics. Of course, we interact with plants all the time, right? We, I'm sure everyone, maybe very few people, um, all of us, I mean, many, the majority of us eat plants. Right? Um, we rarely talk about our ethical relations to plants. I mean, we, we spend more time thinking about our ethical relations to animals. So precisely by doing this sort of ecosexual performance, I, I hope to bring these sort of ethical issues to the foreground in our relations to plants. I think many people are doing this at, a, um, at the same time. It's, I, you know, the, the, this, this question of trust, it's, is it that we, you know, the trust between us um, or in this particular situation in this, is it just the trust in the sexual situation or is it a trust in the sort of the visualizing situation? I think there are also many layers of this um, trust, right? And also, you know, how, how do we even think about the activity that we're doing now, right? So we're talking about plants as humans, right? So we are, you know, I always say that I'm also hypocritical because I'm I'm still talking to humans, right? I'm still, you know, I'm still doing a discussion purely with humans on human language, et cetera, yeah. May I um, mm -hmm. maybe jump in quickly and, and grab the question you actually already offered? 
uh, which was like on your uh, current research in, in Berlin, the botanical comrades, uh, how do plants practice politics? Maybe you can elaborate that a little bit. And it, for me, it also connects to this. You've been talking a lot about weeds, but you never really, um, how would you say, told us what kind of importance weeds have for you or for, I think, I guess also for political practice or for urban context. Right. Right. So there, there are two levels. Um, like I, um, when I first started working with plants, I was working mainly with weeds because I was responding to the urban situation in China, where uh, as we as we deepen in our modernization, we don't want to see weeds. Right? We want to we want to have clean city. We we want to have like a, a sort of a, a bourgeois landscape, etc. So I was more thinking about. Um, the role of weeds in 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 our politics uh, entangled in our politics. Of course, you know there are also uh, genetic reasons why weeds are weeds, right? They can they can respond, they can grow very fast, they can propagate really fast, etc. But now in Berlin, I'm more like I said, I'm 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 trying to move away from just seeing how plants are entangled in human politics. I want to see how they actually practice politics. So one example I learned um, from, you know, just talking to scientists here. So there's one scientist who studies uh, adapt, you know, uh, plasticity, meaning how plants are flexible, right? So they can, uh, if they grow in a coat, like we're talking about genetically the same plants. So they can, they can actually respond to different um, climate situation by, and then change their bodies. You know, in Berlin, of, of course, the trees are doing it right now. They, they, the leaves fall, and then next spring, the leaves grow. But she's talking about how different plants, uh, when they grow in colder climate, in, in a colder temperature, the flower size changes, right? Um, so, you know, that just triggered something in my mind that the way plants actually practice things is really by changing their bodies. We tend to think about uh, practice in terms of behavior, in terms of language, et cetera. For them, practice is really bodily. Um, so if we really want to understand how they practice politics, then we need to think about how at least, you know, even if we're thinking about the same political issues, then we have to look at, you know, we, we, we go voting where we talk about our ideology, but for them, for them to think about, you know, for, for us to understand their ideology, we have to look at their body, body, body form. So these are sort of initial directions. Um, this is only just, you know, I just started this a couple of months ago. So these are just the ideas. And then, like I said, they remain as um, conversations, uh, as ideas, uh, rather than more visual um, works. Yeah. And um, I had another um, content-wise uh, question. You were talking about this manifesto of let's call it ecological equality uh, which you did in uh, which based on this 1922 manifesto um, maybe you can give us an example of what what is written in there like what is one of the ideas or the, the how to say yeah topics So um, one of the ideas, actually, I mean, I, I, I won't share the slides, um, but if, if people are interested, I can, um, I'll put it online pretty soon. So one of the ideas was actually about um, art making. So one of the, um, it's actually a senior artist there, and he said, um, um, when we think about it, equality among species is not just about resources and um, um, sort of land, et cetera. It's also about art making. So he's, he, in the manifesto, I, I'm not translating, I'm paraphrasing. So the idea is um, art making should be an activity um, perceived, but also allowed, not only for humans, but also for other species. Um, I think that has really, 
inspire me also to 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 say what I said um, when I was doing the presentation. How um, we collaborate with other species when we think about art making, we don't take the full credit because we never really um, really create anything. We're always inspired. But he, you know, he's also saying um, there are also. You know, we also talk about specific, I mean, I, the, there, there's a sheet where we talk about specific mechanisms of how to encourage uh, art making by other species, etc. Or I think I, also the, the first step for me in my mind is always how do we perceive other forms of life, what they're doing, and how, you know, it's also how do we interpret what they're doing. Um, a lot of your ideas also connect to, how do you call it, famous <laughs> biologists and, and authors and philosophers today, mm -hmm. and like uh, Donna Haraway or uh, Margolis mm -hmm. or um, Emanuele Coccia. And mm -hmm. he, he has this idea, Emanuele Coccia, about mm -hmm. uh, our a dialogue between humans and plants uh, mm -hmm. or between the, with the biosphere by, by breathing. So maybe that would be like a, a certain, how would you say, direction and how we can uh, elaborate the communication with, with plants uh, in that sense. But my question is more about how, how much of these kind of um, ideas that are, one could say, very trendy at the moment, uh, discussed a lot in, in conferences mm -hmm. and in exhibitions, how do these ideas relate to your um, practice? Um, I met Emmanuel Conchia when I was in Paris in 2016. Um, I think he, that's before he published the book. Um, so we had, um, you know, he, he saw my work and we talked about it. And I think it's, I think it's, of course, I think as, as artists or as critical um, thinkers, we are, Sometimes I, I also feel immediately turned off if, if, if something becomes very trendy, right? Um, but if I, if, I, if I just be more objective, I, I always say it's, it's better, you know, a friend of mine says in the US, half of the humanities scholars are working on environmental, you know, environmental humanities. And, you know, she said it as a, as a sarcastic comment. I said, um, well, it's better than, it's, it's better that this has become trendy than other things become trendy, right? Because I don't, you know, I, I'm really happy working with plants and I feel I'm, I've learned a lot, but still there's just so much, you know, I keep saying there's so much we just don't know, right? So I feel, I actually worry that this becomes too trendy and then you know, in our world too, you know, things shift so fast that we are not really engaged in the most pressing or the most um, important um, issue for a long time. So I actually worry that, that if it becomes too much a hype, then as humans, we shift our attention to other things too quickly. Because like Juan pointed out, and I think you, you talk about breathing, you know, there are many, many things we just don't know. And there are many things that takes, you know, as an individual, it takes years of practice. And, you know, as humans, it takes millions of years of evolution to do. And you talk about breathing and Juan was talking about eating. Um, yeah, because Juan also asked about uh, different knowledge paradigm. In Asia, I, the main paradigm is Chinese medicine, herbal medicine. I haven't worked on this, uh, even though I, I do use herbal medicine myself, but I haven't really engaged as artist on this. Um, I, you know, I, I don't, you know, because we don't have readily other sort of um, psychedelic plants around, um, you know, I'm thinking about going to Yunnan next year, perhaps there's more there with ethnic groups. But I, I often joke too, you know, I teach, I often say, instead of teaching for a whole, whole, whole semester, why don't I just give my students a plant to eat and then they become enlightened uh, over, over an hour. Right? So there are, the, you know, the, these are very legitimate um, projects. I'm sure there are artists who are, um, 
who do these things. Can I add something? Sorry to interrupt. Adrian, are you going to say something? No? Okay. Yeah, it's um, just um, to add something quickly, and it deals with um, this uh, epistemic diversity. When we look, as you said, that there are so many things that we don't know, and uh, probably in the Western, we take them as a trend when they're, we kind of discover them, but some of them, they've been there for since long time. Um, for instance, the Amazonic per per perspectivism, where for the Amazonic uh, tribals, everything is human, including the stones. And then everything that is human, which is everything, uh, um, just became a little bit or more human or less human, let's say, for the shapes that they, they take the, or, or their properties that they have. And that's why the tribals need to do tattoos and to mark their bodies to get this kind of uh, um, distance visually from everything that surrounds them. And I don't know, and probably you, you, you are familiar with the ayahuasca rituals that um, one of the translations of the, the, the meaning of the ayahuasca will be the entangling of souls. Because when you, in, in the ayahuascas, when you actually drink the poison of this plant, um, this plant, you can travel through all these humanities and resolve the problems that the community have. So there's, when I was calling about desire, to me, this is the response of a plant in the body of a large community that goes from different kind of humanities. But of course, this is from a different epistemic uh, tradition that we don't have, unfortunately, much access, but it's very, very intriguing <laughs> anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll say one, you know, about the film. Um, I honestly think there's element that I'm trapped by the ferns because it's, of course, it's me. You know, you can say I have agency. You know, I, I decided to do the film, but I was really taken when I go to the forest, right? So like I said, it's, it's also the plants in Shanghai, which really uh, changed me quite quickly from working with humans to working with plants. So it's, I, I, you know, so, so it, I, I really don't think it's just me deciding what to do, right? So it's also these ferns, they're just so gorgeous. I mean, of course, they're, they're gorgeous, they're mysterious. And, um, um, you know, we, like I said, we also eat the plants. And so um, there's something that, that um, they're doing to me. Um, there's another thing when you said, I, I mean, I'll say this may not be the most politically correct thing to say, I also say, in, in addition to learning from uh, indigenous practice, you know, I, I consider Taoism part of our Chinese indigenous wisdom. In addition to learning from human indigenous wisdom, there is a lot, you know, like I, the, the reason I felt so happy to see the wasp and then bees having sex, because they probably started hundreds, I mean, like millions of years ago, right? So they started doing this. Uh, millions of years ago, before I'm sure, before even indigenous human, so-called indigenous humans, started to do things. So it's also, it's also. I, I think you know now a lot of us are, are paying attention to ind indigenous practice, wisdom, etc. Um, but I'm sure there's, you know, once we once we feel more comfortable in that level, there's another level where we really have to learn from what um, other beings have started doing long before we, we, you know, we are, we are, you know, we are talking, but I'm sure many of us realize we are, we're pretty dumb as um, beings on this planet. Yeah. There's a question from uh, Monica, who's actually here with us, but she wrote it um, also a way of, communi of indirect communication. And she asks, and I think this connects to the dumbness of uh, human beings. Does the cognitive nature of plants play any role in your work? I'm, the computer is low in power. Um, no, I, like I said, I'm, I'm talking to scientists this year trying to learn uh, from their research. Um, I have, you know, I, I, I you know, uh, um, 
you, you mentioned there are these um, um, philosophers. I think I've read probably more theories than science. That's why I'm trying to uh, read more science this year. Um, I'm, I don't think the scientists I've talked to this year have been telling me about cognition. There's one person working on how plants negotiate with uh, bacteria. Um, there is someone working on mycorrhizal fungi. We, you know, I'm making a new short film which will be shown next year. Um, part of it, we talk about um, cognition. Now I just realized um, I, when, when I was talking to Matthias Rilek, a, a ecologist, he was using cognition as our ability to focus and filter out noise so we can recognize things. For example, I'm looking at a screen, I can see, I can see Adrian's face. So I can, that's because I can filter out all the noise around me. And plants don't do it. Plants actually sense things I, so that may not be, I mean, I haven't read people like uh, uh, the Italian guy, I forgot, uh, Stefano, I forgot, you know, uh, there are people who are writing on this. I don't think that would be considered cognition. So plants actually sense things. And one thing very different is they actually taking all the signals. Um, they, 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 they synthesize all the signals in order to make a holistic decision. So there's one part I was talking to the, yes, Stefano Marcuso. So the, Precisely the discussion we had was about our cognitive abilities. You know, I just realized our cognitive abilities actually may actually be a limitation that we um, that we have um, by by focusing, we actually lose the holistic signals. Um, but you know, I, I don't know if ecologists will call this cognition or not. I also jump in with a question mm -hmm. from the Facebook page, actually. Um, so coming back to the notion of desire, um, do you think desire as a natural basic feeling has become something so society looks down at and overlooks? Just as nature desires being overlooked and not appreciated and respected perhaps, how do you view the digitalization that is taking place in the midst of COVID and in terms of all of us coming closer or further away from nature and its true essence? Many people say that they long more for nature now than ever, but at the same time, they aren't able to experience it. Mm. I mean, I, I mentioned um, earlier in a conversation already that the, our desire for nature is probably the strongest we have because so pre precisely like this person is raising the question because we, um, the, the, the technologies and then the, the social system we have built up uh, really suppress this desire. Uh, I'm sure there are better theorists uh, who write on this. I, you know, I, I just wrote something recently to, for myself um, that the less time I spent with humans, including this discussion, the more time I actually have to spend with other beings. Um, um, you know, it's, it's never really, we, we, we don't, none of us have infinite time. So it's really about how much time we spend on doing something versus doing something else, right? So um, I actually really want to, can, you know, uh, watch out the time I spend interacting with other humans uh, in order to spend more time with other uh, beings like plants and birds. And I, you know, I was in a dis earlier discussion uh, with a group of Chinese um, artists and, um, you know, I said um, now in sort of post-industrial societies in particular, it's people who have more privilege, have more access to nature, have more time in nature, right? So it's actually people who have less privilege in society are spending so much time with technology. Um, so this is something I'm sure a lot of people are writing about this. Yeah. So that was a, a very nice hint for my role as a, 
uh, <laughs> course leader. Uh, we are uh, already 10 minutes over time. And we don't want to steal more time from you spending time with other beings than humans. But maybe one la is there one last question or something? Or um, yes, Christina. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Because um, I was fascinated then by how um, you during your presentation at one moment um, there seemed to be a kind of um, a shift or kind of you, this idea of um, um, not trying to control everything anymore in your practice. And I was wondering if since that moment that um, you talked about and letting things more happen or even pla plants guiding you, if something um, changed how you approach things or just this idea of, of, of um, not being in control all the time. I, I find it very fascinating. I, I, I will sound like a preacher now if I say this, um, but, uh, you know, like I, I'm still in the process and I, I really recommend, I mean, I, I, I will break the book. Um, so, so, I mean, I, I think there are two things that really help um, me. One is just to go walk in the forest and also spend, like I said, spend as much time with as um, possible with plants. And then the other thing is like, you know, this book I've been reading um, this year, it's a translation of uh, Dao Te Ching. It's a good translation because it's, it, it's, a, it's a rigorous translation. Um, you know, if you read this, you know, this, this text was written 2,500 years ago and it's very short, it's 5,000 Chinese words. So if you, if you read this text, you, you, you will definitely um, have a strong, you will have the strength to to let things grow um, rather than try to control things. Yeah. I think that is a beautiful ending, you know, for uh, this uh, lovely, great presentation. It also kind of closes an arc to the very beginning of your work where you as a monk walked through, uh, I think it was Austrian nature. Um, so, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both, thank for you. joining us, yeah. for giving, for spending time with human beings and not with monks. <laughs> and uh, thank yeah. You. So this was the last session of today. I think we have now the so-called wrap-up, which is uh, part of the, our institutions, Cluj Cultural Center and Art Encounter Foundation, and myself. So I would give the word to uh, Diana. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you so much to all the speakers today and the participants. So I believe that uh, we leave today's uh, first uh, session of public talks with a series of questions or subjects to reflect on further next week. Perhaps they will come up also in your um, discussions during the school. So starting with Adrian's presentation about the end of future and the relation between utopia and the sense of the now, continuing with uh, Haba means very sharp ref reflection on, uh, on the political inscribed into technology, optics, and the narratives about fem female subjectivity. Then with Carlos's presentation um, about his experience as an artist uh, in and out the, uh, the art world. And finally, to Zeng Bo's uh, ecological uh, view on this cohabitation with the natural environment and this relation that uh, I think we, we are concerned with more and more today. So thank you so much. Uh, I will um, uh, pass on the word to Georgiana. And we see each other then tomorrow. Georgiana will uh, tell you more about the schedule tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Indeed, there are many questions that um, um, we might reflect on during this week. Um, maybe uh, I would add another one that uh, st stuck in my mind regarding the idea of, uh, of the withdrawal from being productive, from being useful or necessary, 
and this connection between uh, usefulness and activity. So um, if we can see this type of uh, idea of inactivity as a spiritual, moral, or uh, even political duty in such a way that uh, uh, we see the world with different eyes or, or interact with uh, um, other beings. So thank you very much, uh, all of you, for, for joining us also on Facebook and to the participants and our wonderful guests. Tomorrow, um, we will uh, start um, as well uh, from um, 10 minutes to 1, so 12.50. And um, we'll, then uh, we'll see each other uh, with uh, Ibrahim Neme, who will uh, talk to us about the possibility of possibility. And uh, we'll continue this arch drawn today. And uh, Jana Varja invites us to take a walk. Um, so her talk is called You Will Never Walk Alone. It's a curatorial presentation in form of a stroll. After which we will meet again with uh, Tara Lazrato in her uh, presentation, Landscapes of Unlearning and Ecology on Ecology, Care and Community. Thank you. Thank I you. would like to um, disagree with, your, uh, with the open questions because basically all the questions were asked, uh, answered no, within each other. It was very nice how certain questions from one talk was then answered, for example, with uh, Bo's ideas. Um, so, yeah, I think it was, a, it, I mean, the, the, the dramaturgy of the day was by chance and by availability, but somehow it gave a nice arch. And I think some of the, yeah, questions that appeared at the beginning were also answered later on. But of course, uh, it is nice to have more questions. So I'm looking forward to seeing all of you tomorrow with our three uh, curators. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you and have a nice bye. Day. bye. Have a good, good night. Day. Thank you. Bye.